Make my own elevator, elevator music, elevator, elevator music. Hi, hi, guys. What's going on? <laughs> oh, chat. Did you know that I got the Elgato foot pedal specifically so I can do voices? I'm going to attempt to see if I can do the voices now. I don't think I can, but I'm going to try. If it's hooked up correctly, I should be able to do the voices. Let's see if this works. Um, excuse me, um, uh, you, Rot Dash, saying nice, saying nice, uh, saying hello, every pony. Is extremely cringe. We're gonna need you to. Um, we're gonna need you to refrain from doing that. Everybody in the chat, please take note. Saying hello, every every pony is extremely cringe. The Brony fandom has always been cringe, and it will always be cringe. I need you to take note. I need everybody to take note. All right. Well, <laughs> obviously, I'm joking. Uh... Are we gonna? What, what, what am I doing here? Uh, what do we? Uh, oh, we're reacting to um, ponytails. We're trying to get our spoop on for October. That's what we're doing. Yeah, I remember now. <laughs> All right. Um, let's let's start this. Uh, uh, ponytails, home sweet home, a candy mare's tale. Chat. Did you know that I used to think? That, uh, 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 wait, where's the button? Here is the button. Did you know that I used to think that I've never listened to, listened to a candy mare's tale? I don't know shit about the candy mare, but all pictures of the candy mare, I always thought it was like Pinkie Pie. And I don't know if it's Pinkie Pie. Uh, 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 I don't know if it's Pinkie Pie. No spoilers, but in my in my head, in my in my brain noggin, in my brain cage, I'm like, dude, that's Pinkie Pie, and I don't know if it's Pinkie Pie, but we'll find out. Let's get this show on the road. Uh, a Candy Mare's Tale, Chapter One of Four. We're reacting to all the chapters here, and by the end, by the end, we will have our answer. Let's so let's see what's up. Morning. The following video contains scenes of graphic violence. Viewer discretion is advised. Mm. I have no idea what that was. Was that Thornquill? You can't be hitting us with the Christmas right now. It's October. Get your Christmas shit out of my stream. Huh. A complex spell flared into life as the old unicorn shuffled through the thin papers of an almost impossibly thick tome. The sigils and eldritch emblems hung flaming in the air as complex calculations weaved them together into a dense matrix of light. All about the tables were piles of books, beakers, and jars of colored fluids, all lit by the soft glow of many dribbling candles. The thick puddles of spent tallow on the cold stone floor, which streamed from wall sconces and dripped from the laden tables, gave some indication of just how long Starswell the Bearded had been at work on this particular thermological display. It was a more mundane device, however, a simple cuckoo clock that chimed to let the old mage know that he was running late. With a grumble and a spark of light from his horn, <laughs> That's the sound of him getting up. Along with the candle flames. He moved to the single shuttered window afforded to his high tower and threw open the shutters to the cold breeze, allowing some of the smoky air from within to drift out in tangled plumes. 
As his vision cleared and adjusted to the light, Starswirl gazed out across the city. Snowflakes fell through the gathering twilight, and the unicorn could not help but smile as his eyes fell on the great spools of ribbon and garland that so festively decorated Cantalot. <laughs> Bells rang out across the snow-wrapped city, bringing merriment and a lightness of the heart to all who heard them. Cantalot was beautiful in the winter, none could deny it, though there were many who remembered the bitter chill which had gripped their ancestral lands. Even those who had every reason to shun the season had to admit that the spires of the former Alagon Citadel sparkled and shone magnificently beneath the frost. Gathering up his cloaks, Starswirl set out into the city. It Bro is just in there just studying. The to gift the city to the unified tribes of Equestria, the old unicorn thought. As with a jingle of oh, is this OC spot time? Hat, okay, all right. Unicorn moved through the busy streets to his destination. Though he was sure that it was as much a gift to their new princesses as to their people, having such a city as the new capital of Equestria could not help but bring pride to even the most jaded heart. One day, he really would have to get around to finding out what land or nation it was to which the other Alicorns had retreated. Is that lost? But given is that the lost off to the right? And their even greater power, he could leave them their mysteries for the time being. There were other matters of import for the fledgling nation, and is that lost kissing mag? Are you guys back there the swapping spit? Part of maintaining order in the new nation, the old unicorn. Ooh, unicorn you guys back there swapping spit. It's like I'm not even paying it. It's like Scribbler is going out of her way to tell me about Star Swirl walking through the city right now, and I'm just like, is Lost and Mag back there kissing? Like I'm so distracted right now. Already. There were new generations being born <laughs> who never knew a time when the tribes had been divided by distrust and disharmony as much as by hegemony. Yet even so, lest they be led to repeat... Is that supposed to be Sunny? I think that's supposed to be Sunny. I don't know who that is, and I don't know who that is if that's supposed to be some my apologies. ...the mistakes of the past, they would need to be educated on where it was that they had come from, and just how fragile was the harmony they now enjoyed. My dumbass probably missed like a whole bunch of lore because I got so distracted by this image, but we'll find out. It had been the princesses themselves <laughs> that suggested that a play be commissioned. They had even set aside a grand hall, almost like unto a cathedral. Wondrous to behold, Starswell thought as he gazed up at the edifice. Even more so inside, as it was bedecked with boughs of holly bright red ribbons and garlands of evergreen for the <coughs> There were hopes, to be sure, that this might become something of an annual remembrance, and Starswirl thought it very likely, given the sea of pony folk that filled the Great Hall from end to end. It was clear from all the bright and smiling faces that this was viewed as something of a novelty, not just for the viewing public, but by all involved. He could see the actors every now and again, nervously twitch aside the voluminous curtains on stage to peek out at the growing crowd. It was possible that never before in the history of pony kind had any pony had such a large crowd to perform for. Mm. While the art form was not unknown in the high courts of the unicorns, the recent past had seen such performances fall out of favor. The unicorns had no time for such distractions when they were still expending their best and brightest on the raising of the sun and the moon. The pegasi, always of a more militaristic bent, saw such frivolities as a sign of weakness. Even the humble earth ponies had shunned what few traveling performers of farce and tragedy they had, for their lot in life had been farce and tragedy enough to contend with in and of itself. Okay, okay, of course, okay. In the past, what few plays were put on would have been for only one tribe at a time, and often only dealing with matters relevant to that tribe. Which is why Starswell had been surprised by the princess's suggestion, and even more surprised by how enthusiastically every pony else had supported the idea, joining in the creation of what Starswell hoped would stand as a potent symbol of harmony. A tale about coming together <laughs> despite distrust and differences, and forming unshakable bonds of friendship that would hopefully prove a shining example to all of Equestria. 
wait a minute, are we in the past? I mean, the instant I saw Star Swirl, I was like, all right, this is like either, this is either like post season seven or something, or we're in the past. And now I'm looking over to the left at Celestia. She still has the pink hair. Like she doesn't have the uh, Abora Borea, Borealis hair. So, or the uh, Aurora fucking mane, you know? So I'm thinking maybe this is the past. This is most definitely the past. How did Loss and Mag end up in the past? They're probably time travelers. We don't know. I don't know. Mag has that fucking book that allows her to do anything. So I, I don't know. Maybe for Christmas they went back a few centuries. They it thought it would be romantic. Then, to say the least, the look on some of the faces of those who sat in places of honor in the audience. Princess Luna and Princess Celestia themselves were in attendance, of course, wearing smiles that were <laughs> just a little strained. What the is this pony's deal? Why is he so upset right off the, the bat? Who sat near them with a stormy look on her face. Clover had been by turns morose and frantic for the last few days, and it was likely that she viewed this play as nothing more than a distraction from the work to which she and Starswell had been so dedicated. It is better for us to take a break and enjoy the play, and be reminded of all the good things that have come from the founding of Equestria, rather than dwelling on the dark problems of the moment. Then again, it was possible that the problem was Commander Hurricane, who sat ramrod straight and blank-faced on the other side of the princesses, flanked by a pair of armed Pegasus guards. <laughs> the commander had been distant of late, but Starswell couldn't blame him. He hoped his friend would come around eventually, but he always had been a Pegasus of action, and it was clear he'd much rather be out scouring the land for enemies rather than sitting in his officer's uniform in this stuffy and loud hall. Princess Platinum and King Bullion were in attendance, of course, but they wore the haughty, distant expressions of all nobility when surrounded by peasants. The only genuine... Princess Platinum and King Bullion. Princess Platinum and King Bullion. Is that Wooten there too? I don't see Wooten. Unless that was his voice. And unless you're talking about this pony, and no, I don't think that's Wooten. Princess Platinum and King Bullion. That's their names. I just want to get everybody up to speed here. And smiles were worn by Smart Cookie and Chancellor Puddinghead. <laughs> Princess of course, Chancellor Pudding. Wait, yeah, we are in the past. We are in the past. Agitation. That verifies it. Would have to remedy that. We can wait until after the play. It was starting now. The curtains were rising. The play began with a cold, wintry wind, the howl of a distant, unseen windigo, and the gentle falling of a few flakes of snow. I think this fic is going to drive me bonkers. That's why I'm here, bro. Not to save you, but so we can go bonkers together. I put Quilt to parchment today for the first time since I was a wee filly. It was my mother who first taught me. Are we still watching a play or? For a rich unicorn family in her youth that expected their staff to know the ways of writing to help teach the little lords and ladies. I find little lords. Quill more difficult than I remembered, but I welcome the distraction. I am keeping this journal purely for that purpose, after all. Who is this dying child? It has been a few months now since my husband and a little pumpkin disappeared. I'm sorry, this dying mare. City or run off to warmer climes. I do not know which. I'd like to think that they did not abandon me willingly. But in my week, oh my moments, god, <laughs> when the cold wind whistles through the cracks in the old homestead. I find that I can't blame them if they did choose to leave me behind. Oh my god, what happened? I barely looked for them more than a few days when they first disappeared. Coward that I am. It doesn't do to dwell on such things. Even so, what few friends I have left seem to think it might help me some to get my true feelings out with this diary. 
since I've staunchly refused to open up to them. I know I'm by no means the only widow, nor even the only mother who's lost a child in these parts. But How did we get those here? Bears had a body to bury. No! At least they could grieve. I feel as though I'm stuck perpetually on the verge of the morning. Yet even so, part of me expects that cabbage-headed husband of mine to come through the door at <laughs> any moment with some tale of wild adventure or lame excuse. What the fuck? Okay, this pony is obviously a boomer, right? Because she's like that cabbage-headed husband of mine. But I've been I've been married for 15 years, and boy, do I hate my husband. Boy, do I hate my wife, and boy, do I hate my husband. It's like, <laughs> why do you? What? What? Why is this a bit? What? And I, I'm so confused as to how we got here at all. But I'm gonna continue. Our little pumpkin, bounding his hooves at this point i don't know if i would hug him or bash his head in for all this worry damn since it's just me that's likely to read this i don't feel ashamed to say that i spent most days in the parlor here at home in hopes that i could find out which idle fancies i fear not good for a lonely heart my friends have suggested I try searching for them again. But I've heard terrible rumors of disappearances and death in the castle town as of late. Mm. While it's possible my loved ones could be victims of the same, it would do them no good if I were to be spirited away as well and they come home to an empty house. Would they know I had searched for them? Would they think I had abandoned them, as I fear they have abandoned me? No, I can't face the city and all those horn heads looking down their noses at the mad widow wandering the streets in search of a lost husband and daughter. Okay, so this is like a... If not, I'd end up in their dungeons for my own good. Is that a... I fear... Is that a derogatory term for unicorns? Oh, you're just a horn head. I don't want to go to the city and get fucking, like, kidnapped at night. And I don't want to be judged by these freaking horn heads. All I can do is wait. Tending to the farm as best I can in this unnatural cold. And hope that someday they will return to me. Or someday I'll be brave enough. To let go. Oh, was that the play? What happened? Why was that the transition? Thank the sun and the moon and all the shining stars in the sky. My little one returned to me today. Really? My little pumpkin. It happened when I was in the wood on the edge of the farm, chipping away at an old oak tree for the stone. I don't. I don't believe that's your. I that's your child. See her as dusk was coming on. And the shadows were growing thick. But I knew it was her as soon as she called out to me. She wore different cloths and seemed unsteady on her hooves. But still, she had the same sweet voice of my little Billy. Something's and up. We embraced for so long, snow had time to settle in our hair. She was so small and fragile, such a delicate thing. She barely seemed to weigh anything at all. I got her inside and next to the cherry red stove as quick as I could. She was a ravenous little thing, which wasn't surprising since she was skin and bones. So Something's up. Meal. The first family meal since she disappeared. <laughs> Something's up. Course. Wait a minute. Oh, Something's I up. I can barely remember what about. This has all just been one huge whirlwind for me. In truth, I fear I may be dreaming or telling a little fib to myself in my waking hours. I just might be hallucinating. I can hear her even now. I've let a demon in my house. Of her little hooves as she moves about her room, bringing a warmth to my heart I have not felt in ages. 
The hour is late. I can only imagine what would stir her from her slumber. Nightmares, most likely. About the ordeal she went through getting home. Or perhaps, what was done to her in that wicked city. I want to ask her, but part of me wonders if I really want to know the truth about what happened to her. Part of me just thinks I should be happy to have her back and just let whatever happened be. She, I, I don't think she came back right. alone. I, I think something's up. Some pony hurt my little pumpkin. As much as it sickens me to think about, I need to know. I need to see them brought to justice for taking her away from me and doing who knows what to her. Ain't her no father, demon afraid of the legal how system. I've forgotten her cabbage head of a father. Does she know what happened to him as well? Did he abandon her? I could never believe that of him. Not in my wildest dreams. But then, where is he? Have Not I there. A daughter, only to lose any hope of seeing my husband ever again. Why would you want to see him? You call him a cabbage head all the time. Like this, but I know such bitter sweet thoughts will haunt my dreams tonight. I fear, like my little one, I will have a hard time sleeping. Still, I will wait until morning to question my daughter. Undoubtedly, she has been through much to return to me, and I wouldn't think of tormenting her by bombarding her with questions at this late hour. Mm. Perhaps mm. tomorrow, over breakfast. Though our food stores are running low thanks to this blasted weather, I will make a homecoming feast the likes of which no pony has eaten before. All right. Okay. I place pen to parchment once again. Oh no, what happened? <laughs> I'm sorry, is something wrong? <laughs> words down, lest the thoughts in my head burst out of their own accord and fly off on gossamer wings from my fevered brain. I have fallen ill. The suddenness and severity of my malady is worse than any I've experienced before in my life. She must have got COVID. I find myself dizzy and delirious by turns. Yep, that sounds I like COVID. I <laughs> rise from my bed for fear of what I might see and what I might hear. The smells are the worst. And sometimes I'm not sure if they're... Okay, it's not COVID. You lose your sense of smell if it's COVID. But I'm running away from my fears, even as I try to put them on paper. Is your body okay? <laughs> Alter. I must face the things I dread. My daughter is not my daughter. Oh, you don't say! No, that sounds strange and like the ravings of a diseased mind. But I swear now that this is something I've suspected ever since she returned home. At first, I tried to explain it away as a product <sighs> of whatever ordeal she had been through. Whenever I asked about what happened to her, she was vague and evasive. Even more so when I asked after her father what had become of him. She was never one for telling lies before. But I fear she's lying to me now when she says she doesn't know what became of him. <laughs> There's something in her eyes that makes me think she knows exactly what happened to Cabbage Patch. Her cutie eyes. mark is strawberries. Were they always that faded a shade of green? Was her scarlet mane always so wild and unmanageable? I remember once her happy voice filled our home with joy as she sang little songs she made up to entertain her. That is no longer your daughter, no. miss. She only sings one song over and over and over, just under her breath between giggling fits. Either the ordeal of my child has been through has driven her slightly mad, or... or I fear something darker. From my mother, I heard tales of creatures 
that once plagued the pony tribes. They were beasts that took the faces of your loved ones and took their place. Made you believe they were the genuine article and then slowly drain their victim's love away. Wait, what's up with her body? I'm just guessing that she doesn't eat a lot. The face of my child and used it to worm its way into my home, into my heart. Is that why I've fallen so desperately ill and my daughter seems so strange? If it were true, I'm not sure how I would really feel. I should be outraged, I know. But I was so happy to have her back. Even it is all just a lie. Such treacherous feelings make it difficult for me to know what to believe. There are reasons to doubt these suspicions, of course. For instance, how would such a creature learn of my loss? Most of my neighbors have moved away, trying to escape the bitter cold. And why choose my daughter? Why didn't you instead? get the fuck out? <laughs> well, it's true, I loved my baby girl. It's probably a money issue, right? No one can say I did not love my husband, truly. I fear Nobody can say that I didn't love my cabbage-headed husband. Exactly how truly. And that's something I wish to not dwell on in my sick bed. Truth be told. It's not just my daughter that is strange to me these days, but the very house itself. I feel like a stranger in my own home. Doors That's not your home anymore. From day to day. I Wait, doors are disappearing? Doors look somehow closer at night. Though even I realize it's foolish to think the trees have moved. But the voices the screams drifting from those dark woods. Am I truly imagining those? Am I dreaming? They're almost as awful as the strange smells that flood the house when I'm trying to sleep. Sometimes <laughs> it's achingly sweet. Sweeter than the fields in springtime with all the flowers in bloom. Sounds like the candy mare to me. Sometimes it's putrid. Like the worst rot and decay you could imagine. All mildewing and festering like the underside of a dried up bog. I know the simplest explanation is not that my daughter is secretly a monster. Or my old homestead has taken on a life of its own. I know that the fault must lie with me. But I've never been this sick before. This lost in my own home. My own head. We're running low on food. Or Oh, now you're running low on food? I'm looking at your body right now. It looks like you never had food to begin with. About her strangeness. My little pumpkin has been dutiful in caring for me. She brings me a hot bowl of stew for most meals. Though, for the life of me, I know not what she's using for ingredients. It's thick and rich and a little creamy. No doubt very nourishing as well. It's nothing I ever taught her how to make. Even so, that's hardly something to be suspicious about, isn't it? I hear her coming back now. I think she's fetching me an extra blanket before I try to get a little more rest. I must hide this diary. I wouldn't want my sweet daughter to ever read these words. I don't want her to know her mother's crazy delusions. Day four. Am I still ill? My fever broke some time ago. I'm still a little weak, but I'm strong enough to move about the house. A bitter storm rages outside as I write this, and has for a few days now. Or has it been longer? 
We are witnessing an old mare just fade away. <laughs> That's all we're doing. We are witnessing a mare have a demon for a child, and we are watching her just fade away into nothing. That is all that we are watching right now. Time has lost its meaning for me. Part of me wants to go out. To get into the snow? Share the stench of this house. What I realize to be the smell of my own sickness assaults my nostrils constantly. You'd think I'd grown used to it by now. But every now and again, some stealthy vapor or gentle gust of perfumed air will tickle my nose. And I will feel the same sickness and revulsion as before creeping over me. My daughter has been staying away from me by my express command. Whatever ailment I had, I didn't want to risk her catching it as well. I couldn't stand the thought of losing her to an illness after so recently having her reunited to me. At least, that's how I felt at first. I'm sure that's what I meant. Only, once she was no longer fussing over me, Something sweet to eat goes over the candy mayor's origins as this is technically a prequel. Okay, thank you for thank you for clearing that up for me, Reggie. I had no idea cuz I never looked into the candy mayor stuff until today. That's when I started to feel a little better. I fear my mind, however. And this there is no there is no better place to start than at the very beginning. So I'm glad I clicked on a video that like goes over the prequel. Began to wander even more. What was she doing? What like is wrong with your legs? <laughs> was she getting fresh wood to keep the house so warm and toasty? Where was she getting the food that I now know must be all but exhausted? The rich stew she left at my bedroom door was always piping hot and just as good as my first spoonful. Was she actually weathering the storm to keep me in such comfort? How could her tiny, fragile frame withstand the bitter cold? Because that is not She's your daughter. Active during the day, instead moving about the house the most at night. Once I was no longer drifting in and out of sleep, I stayed up for a night, just to listen. I don't know what drove me. Insomnia? Paranoia? All I know is that I swear I heard the front door open and close in the dead of night. A silence fell over the house that chilled me to the bone. I swear I could hear her tiny voice drifting beneath my window. For the first time, I listened, really listened, to the words of the song she sings to herself when she thinks I can't hear. It wasn't until that song, that laughter, had dwindled into the distance that I dared rise from my bed and lock my bedroom door. That settles it. I'm afraid she is no daughter of mine. She is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Oh, really? That, that's the concern right now? Day five. I pray that I have gone mad. <laughs> I dare Every not <laughs> back, for I know that I am never Every entry is the same. It's like I it's like day 312. I have gone insane. <laughs> I saw my daughter levitate above the table and T pose. Am I going mad? It's like, yes, you're not going mad. You have a demon in your house. You're alone in darkness. <coughs> Is the bright Hi, day Fluffy. Or at least I 
think it must be. The light that filters fit the <clears throat> Fluffy, did you take part in this fanfic? Like or this, this, um, me. creation? Or this voice adaptation, or whatever you would call this? Nothing but dull gray and white, or as far as I can see. But even so, it's not nearly as bleak as my home has become. Nothing makes sense in this place anymore. You are old. <laughs> I Have I died? Is this Tartarus? Is this house meant to be my prison for the rest of eternity? God damn, can Is we talk my about my smiling jailer? I enjoyed voicing in this project. Okay, I wanted to clarify if you did a voice. Um, don't... Oh God, don't tell me the voices you've done. I want to. I want to read the credits at the end of this, and then I'll be like, "Oh, there's Fluffy." But um, can we talk about her fucking eyes? Like, she's been awake for like three weeks, and is this her body? Has she been eating? What is going on here? Well, obviously her daughter is a demon, but like. Oh my god, you're a corpse. You're a corpse writing in a journal right now. Updating a fucking deviant art post. Every time I think of escape, the doors lead to new rooms or blank walls. Never outside. The windows too are fastened tight. She is literally a skeleton, my dude. I cannot break the thick glass. Oh, I wish I could break off just one tiny shard. How She's I been staring into the sun. Limbs of freedom, even if it came at the edge of a piece of glass. There are so many things I regret now. I regret agreeing to let my little girl go to the castle town. I regret not being there to protect her. Then jump out the window. Dude, that won't work. There's a lot of snow on the ground. It'll cushion her fall. I regret welcoming her home. Or rather, <laughs> Even though it he... does kind of look like if I just stood next to her and tipped her over, she would explode. So I don't know. Maybe that would work. Like, she looks so fragile right now. That wears her smile, sings with her voice, and smells of death and candy. I regret knowing what it is I've been eating these past months. Knowing that if I try to stop eating, she'll force feed me. I regret hearing them crying under the floorboards. I what? regret not being able to do anything for them. What? Who's not crying up under the floorboards? I not do anything for myself. I regret going down to the cellar in the first place. <laughs> Seeing that thing crawl out of the pony I had mistook for my daughter. What? What's happening? She came sliding effortlessly out of the dead girl's lifeless mouth and riding into the ship of another filly altogether in the darkness. I regret seeing her smiling and laughing as she gorged herself on the poor unfortunates that shivered, broken in the dark below my house. Candy teeth gleaming dully beneath a bloody sheen. I have okay. heard whispers about the disappearances at the castle town. It's true. But I hadn't believed them. A pony made of candy that lures away children. That plays evil little tricks. God, you look awful. Her <laughs> own stallion and strip the flesh from his bones in moments with a candy corn smile. <laughs> Foolishness. <laughs> Foolishness. Rumor and poppycock. I regret not believing. 
I regret being alive. Ah, oh, come on, don't say that. You gotta be on the up and up. Day five, what she's gonna say now? It's a long pause. Are we, are we still watching the play? Overhead, the sky was a uniform white. The heavens mirrored the ground below, where two ponies trod carefully. Their hooves crunched through the crust of sparkling frost and plunged down into a thick layer of dirty snow. The drifts here were old, only slightly dusted with a few dry flakes which skittered and danced across the crisp surface. Mm. Beneath a thin layer of ice hid the tangled roots and long dead briar of the sleeping forest. And these seemed to rise up like cold dead claws to snag in the pony's cloaks. The older filly helped the colt extricate his leg. Careful now! Step where I step and the going will be easier. There's no telling what lies beneath the surface here, and we can't afford to delay. We gotta keep moving. We have to keep warm. They were woefully unprepared for the circumstances in which they found themselves. Mm. Both wore ragged, threadbare cloaks that did little to keep out the chill. Fortunately, the old woods were thick. Most of the new snow was suspended above them, cradled in the twisted, winding limbs of the bare trees. Thick as the woods grew, this place would be lit only in patches of light and shadow, even in high summer. Mm. As it was, in the dead of winter, it felt less like they were moving through a forest, and more like they were traveling through a network of caves. Barely any light reached them, though the one advantage of this was that the trees blocked out most of the savage wind. They could hear it howling above as the storm raged on, and were thankful that they were spared the brunt of that vicious gale. Even so, an occasional blast of wind would scythe through the trees and bite deep into their flesh, chilling them to the bone and urging them onward in search of shelter. Oh, but Gretel, I'm so tired, intoned the weary colt, his teeth chattering. Oh. Can't we rest for just a moment? I can feel the chill traveling up my legs. What? How, why, and who made a kid, pony creature made of candy that eats ponies? Well, at least, at least I have an answer to my question. And the, that question was, is the candy mare some form of Pinkie Pie? And the answer is no, because this takes place before Pinkie Pie was even born. So, <laughs> I'm, I have an answer to one of my questions. Looking at my bones, I feel if I do not stop to warm myself, I shall freeze. Their voices sounded oddly loud in the stillness that gripped the woods, though their frigid lungs could barely manage more than a whisper. Small showers of snow fell all around them, leaking between the tree limbs above the quiet hiss. If we were to stop, then we would certainly freeze, dear Hans. The dear Hans? The moved closer to her brother to share some of her warmth. Her the little brother! Her uh, brother. Okay, I'm and already under the impression that both stop of them are going to die, please. but... <laughs> but we have to keep going. We have to find a way out of this forest. Or at least some kind of shelter. Not going to spoil. Animals. Thank you for that. I appreciate you. Even as she said this, what little light they had beneath the canopy of snow and twisted limbs seemed to fade. The storm was growing worse. It would not be long until what little illumination they had was extinguished altogether. Oh, no. Soon, they would be in a world of nothing but darkness and snow, with naught but bare tree bark for comfort, and a blanket oh, God. of snow to keep themselves warm. Gretel didn't want to spend another sleepless night is this Hansel and Gretel? No, 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 no. Stop, 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 stop. His name is Hans and her name is Gretel. Is this Hansel and Gretel? Scribbler, are you doing a Hansel and Gretel thing right now? She's not here, but somebody somebody, go get Scribbler and ask her, is this a Hansel and Gretel bit? She didn't write this. Did she write this? Wait a minute. Did she write this? I don't know if she wrote this, but is this like a Hansel and Gretel bit? I think this is a Hansel and Gretel bit. It just now hit me. Wouldn't have enough strength. 
I don't remember the story of Hansel and Gretel, but I recognize the names. ...to extract themselves in the morning. Or worse, worrying that her brother might stop breathing in the night, his lungs frozen from the inside out, leaving her... Actually, nobody gets Scribbler because she's... <laughs> it just now hit me. Scribbler caught COVID recently. So now she's spending most of her time trying to recover. And I don't want anybody to get her and be like, Wolf is reacting to your stuff. Like, let, let her rest. She's going to need it. Uh, with only his corpse for company. It felt like it had been days since the pair of earth ponies had lost their way. They had been traveling with their mother and father after hearing of a land far to the south where the breezes were warm and there fell soft rains instead of sleet. And no, Mother she didn't write this. Okay, okay, okay. She just found it and After put audio the over it. All right. Snow so long, she regarded even whispers of warmth as something of a fairy tale. But even she had brightened once they had started traveling. The thought of a land full of rich, dark soil, not frozen hard and locked away beneath a layer of frost, was just too tempting to ignore. They would have to start over. But the old farm hadn't produced more than a few scraggly strawberries in months anyway, so that didn't really matter. It had been time to move on. Perhaps it had actually been past time. Many families had already moved south before the blizzard came upon the traveling family. If only Gretel and Hansel's parents had been traveling in one of the earlier caravans instead of on their own, they might never have been separated. Then again, perhaps not. The storm had sprung up like a wall of white, distorting the land and threatening to sap the life from them. Some dark shape moved in the <coughs> whiteout, and though they could not see what it was, the shrieks and screams of their parents told them they did not want to find out. The siblings had been extremely lucky to find the scant shelter they had in the shadows of the Black Forest. Even if it meant they were now hopelessly lost, at least they were alive and still together. Thinking not for long. Parents, <laughs> made Gretel's eyes tear up, but she forced herself not to cry. It was just that there was no way of knowing for sure if her mother and father had survived. While they were hardy earth ponies, being powerfully built and used to the hardship that came with working the land, they hadn't just been fighting the cold, but whatever had come swooping out of the storm. Her parents might be okay, she told herself. But she knew, even if they had survived whatever attacked their caravan, that even the hardiest ponies could still find themselves dead beneath a layer of snow in a matter of moments in this blizzard. Nightmare night, what a fright. Give me something sweet to bite. I see you in the chat, trucker brony. Ugh. She sniffled slightly, but that was all she would allow herself. She had to stay strong for her brother falling to pieces now would only ensure their own deaths. Gathering up her brother and shielding him with her cloak, the pair trudged on, searching for the path they had lost so long ago, searching for their parents, or at least hoping to find a little food and a bit of shelter. The wind whistled mournfully overhead, a harsh accompaniment to the sound of their chattering teeth and the loud groans of their empty stomachs. Their last meal had not been particularly filling, the rations one eats while traveling rarely being served hot or in large amounts. Even that meager fare was deeply missed now. The pair had not found more than a few berries since becoming lost, which Gretel was sure had to be poisonous. Nothing should be so bright a shade of <laughs> so red. So we're these cold and poisoned. Though it was far more likely they would die of cold and exposure before long, the angry pangs of hunger coming from their weakening bodies did mm. not make their fight for survival any easier. Mm. Which is when Hansel first ride out. Do you smell that, Gretty? Oh no, she here it comes. They were finally going mad. The scent that came to her nostrils couldn't possibly be here in the wilderness. Gingerbread. I smell gingerbread. Oh my god, Why here it comes. They're getting lured away. In the middle of the forest. It did not make any sense. Hansel, energized by the smell, dashed off through the snow, following his nose. Wait, Hans, don't rush off. We have to stay again. Her cry died on her lips. It can't be. Her brother, 
stood stock still just before a wide clearing. The field, or perhaps farmland, for she thought she recognized the trappings of one, was perfectly frozen. A vast expanse of sparkling white beneath a sky of the same black hue almost glowed in the shadow-free light. The only spot of color lay in the middle of the clearing, where stood a small cottage. This should have been cause for cheer. That's bait. That is bait. That is 100% bait. There is no gingerbread house in the middle of this godforsaken forest. That's bait. These characters are dead, and I'm here to see how they perish. The curling smoke coming from the stovepipe and the light spilling from its thick windows... Look at that goofy shit. <laughs> Yet the entire edifice, from porch to roof, was a riot of bright and chaotic color, almost as though it were made of candy instead of wood and spackle. Indeed, from the smell, it didn't just look to be made of sweets, but in fact was composed of more candy than the children had seen in their entire lives. Even the snow that sat on the low cottage roof and hung from it in tapering icicles appeared to be made from thick and creamy frosting. The you know, I was asking this question days ago and it had nothing to do with this fic. But I was like, bruh, if you lived in a gingerbread house, wouldn't that be more of a detriment than anything? Because you literally, you live in a place that's made out of food. And food cannot survive the elements that much. It, it, it's like, the draw of a gingerbread house is like, oh, you could like eat it. But why would I want to eat my own house? Wouldn't you make, wouldn't you rather hand me like a gingerbread cookie? I'd rather ha eat a gingerbread cookie than eat my own house that's made out of gingerbread. Even if I went up to somebody whose house was made out of gingerbread, I'm not going to eat their house because it's their fucking house. <laughs> that's so rude to just bite into somebody's house, even if it is made out of food. I'm sorry, but continuing. The scent of it hung heavy in the cold air, and the warm, sweet aroma caused their mouths to water, even as they stared in wonder and amazement. It can't be. I'm mad. This is a hallucination. If this was some delusion or hallucination, it seems that Hansel shared it. The colt bounded across the clearing, leaving small hoof prints on the spotless snow. As soon as he reached the cottage, he immediately broke off a shingle from the low-hanging roof and greedily began to gobble it down. As That's somebody's house! Point, Actually, no, it's not. It's a, it's a hallucination, but whatever. Not come up and smack the bit of gingerbread from his hooves. What do you think you're doing? Going around and eating other ponies houses? You could have at least asked first. Oh, but I'm so hungry. So am I. But if this place is real, we need to be cautious. I can't believe this is a play on Hansel and Gretel. She keep it all for themselves. I don't remember how Hansel and Gretel went, but I'm going to quickly Google Hansel and Gretel and just read from that story because I think this is like the same story. Hansel and Gretel. According to Wikipedia, Hansel and Gretel is a German fairy tale collected by the German brothers Grimm and published in 1812 in Grimm's Fairy Tales. What is the story of Hansel and Gretel? Hansel and Gretel are a brother and sister abandoned in a forest where they fall into the hands of a witch who lives in a house made of gingerbread, cake, and candy. The cannibalistic witch intends to fatten Hansel, <laughs> fatten Hansel before eventually eating him, but Gret Gretel pushes the witch in her own oven and kills her. I don't think this story is going to end like that. I think this is the bad ending to Hansel and Gretel. Okay, fine. Let, let's see, let's see, let's see. As if on cue, the front door of the cottage creaked open. A blast of warm, <laughs> sweet air washed over the shivering siblings. It felt so good, Gretel thought she would melt right then and there. It seemed the door had swung open on its own, though there was no pony there to greet them. Boy, oh boy! Maybe she could resist the temptation to devour the candy cottage. Her body would not let her forsake the warmth of the inviting home. 
It did not help matters that they were completely exposed to the wind in this clearing, when the options were to enter a warm cottage or take their chances back beneath the scant shelter of the Black Forest, the choice was obvious. Be on your guard, Hans, whispered his sister, before calling out in a slightly louder voice. Hello? Is anybody here? Me You're telling me you don't eat people's candy houses? No, I don't eat people's candy houses. That's rude. No pony answered. It seemed whoever owned this cottage was out at the moment. If you eat somebody's candy house, are you going to pay for the damages? What if you take a big chunk out of their roof? You're going to pay for that roof damage? Fucking owner of the house walks out. He's like, hey, you took a bite out of my roof. That'll be a thousand dollars. Like, oh, fuck. Nobody in chat has a thousand dollars just to give to house damages right now. Not one of you. Not even me. The pair walk Here's what I would do. Take some chunks of food, then run like shit. I mean, just take those giant lollipops. They aren't part of the house. What the fuck? Yeah, because I'm, I'm freezing and starving. A thing that's going to fill me up is a giant, cartoonishly sized lollipop. Yeah, that's what I want in my stomach. Walked over the threshold. That ought to fill me right up. ...of the cottage, closing the door gently behind them. They found themselves in what looked like a sitting room. Pictures were hung on the walls, and knickknacks and bric-a-brac were strewn here and there across shelves, tables, and cabinets. While the outside had been a fantastic and masterpiece of confection, the inside oh. reminded the siblings almost hauntingly of their old homestead. Just like the outside, however, everything from the couch to the throw rug to the tiny crystal figurines on a shelf all seem to be made of candy i wonder what's Even actually the happening to their bodies foods, right now though it looked like hardwood had the consistency of fudge they could not help wandering further into the tiny cottage exploring the bizarre yet familiar home moving towards the source of warmth and light in the next room they moved through a hallway decorated with candy portraits and framed landscapes these had an elementary roughness to them oh Some no there's the oven artwork to gretel and more like the crude drawings a young filly might create and display proudly on her bedroom wall beyond the hallway they came to what looked like a kitchen a door set in the far wall led back outside and another doorway yawned open leading into what looked like a bedroom there was also a set of stairs by the hall where they had entered that appeared to lead up to a loft. As had been the case so far, everything in this room seemed to be made of sweets as well. Pots and pans. And so what candy would the drapes be? I'm, bro, I'm just guessing like they're made out of licorice or something. Some green apple licorice or something. Knives and spoons all hung from candy cane. You know, like a fruit roll up. Even the source of but just like a very wide very fruit roll up. Stove was in the shape of a pumpkin with a wide grin for a grating. Gretel could not help but feel that the jack-o'-lantern's eyes, with their flickering flames, were watching her. Mm. But that was a ridiculous thought. It was probably just the strange gaze of the pictures in the hall. Despite their crude nature, the lollipop eyes the portraits possessed seemed to follow her around the tiny kitchen. Found. Hansel had tripped over a small handle set in the floor. As the oh no! Lit the handle and started to lift, a section of the floor began to rise. He'd found a trap. Don't door, go in the basement. <laughs> into some sort of root cellar. Don't go Just into the cellar. To lift it higher so they could have a peek inside. No! <laughs> slammed down on the door, causing Hansel to fall flat on his face. Get out! Get out now! Gretel gasped and took an involuntary step back. She had no idea where the other pony had come from, but she was hideous. Old and wrinkled, the mare's grey hair was dishevelled and hung in filthy clumps around her face. Her clothes were worse, mere rags, and completely unsuited for a cold climate. A witch! It all made sense now. 
they had stumbled into some witch's enchanted cottage. Oh, yeah. It shouldn't be here. Get out. Get out now. The witch whispered urgently. She advanced on the pair of children, eyes wild. For their part, they backed quickly out of the kitchen and into the hallway. I'm sorry, ma'am. We didn't know you were home. We were just trying to find a place to warm ourselves. Gretel drew her brother protectively close. And have a bite to, to eat, stammered Hansel. She elbowed her brother hard in the ribs. This seemed to cause the old hag to pause. Eat? She leaned uncomfortably close as the children found their backs <laughs> against a wall. Eat, did you say? Have you eat? two eaten something? No? Yes. Then they what's in your mouth? Carefully. Gretel knew what happened to folks who lied to witches. The stories always said they were turned into toads. Though the cold outside already bit her flanks hard, she could not imagine what it would be like in the slimy skin of a toad. She didn't want to find out, so she blurted out the truth frantically. My brother ate a piece of your cottage, but please don't be angry. We were just so hungry, ma'am. He didn't know any better. <sighs> that caused the old mare to snort, though her eyes lost some of their wildness to sadness. No, no, I believe you, child. I doubt very much the little tyke knew what he was doing. Her whisper was bitter. Without warning, she suddenly grabbed Hansel and hauled him back into the kitchen. Get while you still can, girl. And never come back. Better you die in the snow than see what fate awaits him here. Oh, so she's like, she's like, she's like, listen. You guys need to leave. I know it seems like I'm the bad guy, but if you guys stick around, you're going to figure out who the real bad guy is. Ready, sis! Hansel cried out as the filthy mare dragged him to the very trapdoor he had found before. The hag flung it open, revealing its dark depths to the firelight as she flung the boy inside. What? Why? Wait, wait a minute. I thought you were... Well, all right. Without thinking... Gretel leaped in after him. No! You stupid Billy! You don't want to go down there! The witch hadn't raised Is her that cloud nine? time, but she had whispered frantically. Now, however, she screeched loud enough to wake the dead. By the stove light that filtered in from above, Gretel thought she could see why. Down here in the darkness, hanging oh, no. candy cane hooks, and piled on marzipan trusses. Oh, there is some Texas Chainsaw Massacre bullshit. I'm about, I'm about to see some. I'm about to see some gruesome shit, aren't I? It was one pony carcass after another. Some had been skinned and smoked, their headless bodies hanging from the ceiling. Others still lay mostly intact, oh. sleeping in barrels of salt or brine, their eyes milky and faces stretched by rigor mortis grins. They were mostly children, fillies and colts, a few tiny foals, all stretched and splayed and dripping as far as the eye could see in the flickering light. Gretel was going to be sick. Ah, oh, don't throw up now! It's gross enough down here already! God damn it! Hansel, for his part, already was. He was vomiting violently. A dark mixture of <laughs> gingerbread and blood. She had to get him out of here, now. Grabbing her brother, she tried to pull him back up the ladder. The hag met her at the top. No! You witch! You beast! You're not gonna have me and my brother for your sick water! Move or I'll break every brittle bone in your shriveled up body! The filly howled with anger and fear, meaning every word. To her surprise, the old mare backed away and let her up into the kitchen. You don't understand! You don't understand! You have to leave him! It's the only way! Leave what, is like, a, is like a sacrifice? The old hag was frantic, pawing the floor with her hooves, strands of her filthy hair sticking to her cracked lips. Just then, the sound, oh God, no. sound of children's laughter 
echoed from the loft above. Here we go, our the star of the show. The hag was immediate. Every inch of her shivering as if she were gripped by a terrible chill. To Gretel's amazement, the disheveled mare began to weep. <laughs> What's that then? More victims? More falls to your slaughter? <laughs> Gretel backed herself and Hansel toward the nearest exit. No, child. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> the old mare blubbered like an injured child. That's not the lamb you hear bleating. That's the wolf. The wolf. The what? Gretel turned to spring out of the back door and slammed into a blank wall. Where there had been a door before, there was nothing but a smooth surface. She whirled back around. The entire kitchen had changed. Gone were the doors leading from it and the trap door that had hidden the nightmare below. God fucking damn it. The entire room seemed to twist and distort as she watched, stretching and shrinking like a living thing. Everything had taken on a more sinister light, even the oven's goofy pumpkin grin having turned into a sinister, sharp-toothed smile. Gretel could have sworn that she could see faces leering from within the flames. Witch! I don't know what magic this is! But you best let me and my brother go. I'm warning you. A parent is sure to be looking for us. <laughs> it's not my choice. <laughs> I would if I could. I, I would if I could. <laughs> what is your role here? <laughs> the entire kitchen seemed to warp and move. Candies detached from places all over the room slithering to a spot just behind the old man. Bit by bit, piece by piece, something took shape at her side. Oh, no. Hey there. Did these nasty fools make you cry? In a blink, a filly, made entirely out of sweets, stood by the weeping biddy. Oh, God, that is... I don't like that. The hag's sticky hair. Soon enough. <laughs> Her ears are waffle coats. <laughs> Her ears are waffle cones, my dude. I heard of I heard of the candy corn teeth, but her ears are waffle cones. Okay, all right. I'm not gonna. Good design. Good design. That's all I'm saying. Really giggled as the crone's head sank into her hooves. The creature's candy-swirled eyes flashed behind bits of her red and black licorice mane. Hello, boys and girls. Would you like something sweet to bite? She definitely does sound like Pinkie Pie. I'll give her that. Gretel didn't know what was going on, but she had to find a way out, <coughs> if not for herself, then for her brother. <coughs> At that moment, Hansel slumped at her side. I don't feel so good, Gretty. He muttered. Why did you eat the candy, you fuck? Oh, God damn it. Oh my God, what, <laughs> what happened to him? Gretel started screaming as she watched her little brother's flesh pop and tear. Skin ripping to tattered shreds before. Her oh eyes. my god! No, please, Hansel, what's happened to you? She watched, helpless and disbelieving, as something shiny and sweet slithered from the fleshy sheath that had been Hansel. <laughs> this new pony, which looked much like her brother, save for being composed entirely of gingerbread, grinned cheerfully at its former sister. Its gumdrop eyes sparkled as it moved toward her. I am and different now. Move, took a bite from her rosy cheek. <laughs> oh, she don't do that. Herself back, still screaming as she held a hoof over the ragged wound on her face. This was a nightmare. It had to be a nightmare.
What's the matter? Don't recognize your brother? <laughs> Alright, that's enough of that. <laughs> As if reading her mind, the filly above them began to sing mockingly. It was then that it finally dawned on Gretel what was going on. The Candy Mare. Every filly had heard the stories of foals led astray God by damn Candy Mare. Heard from again. Every colt had whispered to friends of dark and devious tricks played on the unsuspecting in the middle of dark nights that ended in death. But that all happened on Nightmare Night. When the farmers and villagers would leave out sugary peace offerings and lock themselves tight inside their homes until daybreak. Nightmare night had been months ago. Why was the candy mare here now, in deepest winter? What was Bro, going this on? is just chapter one. I know what chapter I'm on. Jesus Christ! Gretel didn't know what she expected to happen next. But watching the candy filly swell in size and crash into the gingerbread Hansel in a wave of teeth and claws was not it. The thing that used to be her brother squealed and gave a warbling shriek as hunks of its body were devoured greedily. The sound was all the more gut-wrenching, since Gretel could hear bits and pieces of her little brother's voice buried in those distorted screams. Before her eyes, <sighs> the candy mare devoured the gingerbread abomination and licked up the gory pile of what had once been her little brother. The okay. sick scene left her speechless. What could she do against such a bizarre creature? Nothing, you no just escape, die. No hope. What was she supposed to do? I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Muttered the old hag over and over as the candy mare licked blood from her smile with a long taffy tongue. Oh, what am I but gonna see? The monster wasn't done. Licorice hair moved of its own accord like a living thing, sneaking across the kitchen floor and wrapping around each of Gretel's limbs before she could so much as blink. She could feel the fronds biting deep into her flesh, breaking the skin. Panicking, she tried desperately to shake off the monster's vice-like grip, but it was far too late. The tendrils of candy lifted her into the air, almost bringing her up to the ceiling. Droplets of her blood falling with a pitter patter on the floor below. Never this was to the old pony, though the candy mare never took her eyes off Gretel. Those terrifying, mad candy swirled eyes moved hungrily over her body. It's been a long time since I cooked for you, and even longer since you've had a hot meal. I've been itching my face at. Don't you? The candy monster dragged Gretel forcefully across the ceiling until she was right above the blazing stone. Oh my god! Look at this picture! Turned Look at it. <laughs> That is a beast! Now that is a, a beast in fucking MLP grimdark fashion right there. No wonder there are so many stories about the candy mirror. Holy shit. Completely into a hungry moor. The flames within leaping excitedly as if they too were starving. Bit by bit, the candy mare lowered the young pony carefully over the flames. The fire hissed as Gretel's blood dribbled down her limbs and into the fiery mouth, leaping higher to sear her blistering flesh. The pain was excruciating, making her scream between sobs, her frantic writhing useless as she struggled to loosen the grip of the tendrils. Her tiny hooves kicked in the air. A coughing fit burst from her throat as her mane and tail began to singe, then to burn. She could feel the blisters swelling and popping on her legs as they came uh. closer and closer to the heat. Sores bursting 
and dripping blood and liquid fat over the pumpkin stove's brim. The candy mare only laughed in delight and insanity as Gretel was roasted alive. Eventually, the flames engulfed her tiny body completely, a long tongue of fire licking through her tail and into her mane. The flames quickly washed over the rest of her body. Gretel could feel her skin peel away and her muscles tighten as the moisture in her body began to escape from her skin. Yeah, she can change her size at will. Motherfucker, she's Ant-Man? Steaming flesh. The candy mare's own licorice whip hair melted away. Now she her. has claws. <laughs> she has like Mr. Krabs claws. Into the oven. Her world turned into a wall of orange light. Oddly, the pain seemed to fade away. Agony transmuting into a coldness that gripped her to her core. A thought came to her pain-numbed mind that even in the heart of so hot a flame, even at death's door, she could not escape the cold. As Gretel's eyes popped, melting and running down her cheeks, her brain flashed images and sounds that were strange to her dying senses. As her brain at last succumbed to the heat, she almost contentedly wondered why it was taking so long to die. As she felt her awareness fading, she couldn't help but wonder, what was that delicious smell? I think the worst part about dying like this is the fact that it takes you so long to die. So like you're, you're just in agony for a long time. It's like, it's like your brain is shooting off endorphins to make dying not feel so bad. And at the end of your life, you're just like this mangled corpse being like, okay, when do I get to the afterlife? And you're not at the afterlife yet. And you're just like, okay, any fucking second now. <laughs> Oh, to be cont Oh, yeah, we have three more chapters to go. I'm not going anywhere. You know what I think? You know what I think? I think that that woman in the back was... Was she the... And I'm sorry if this is a dumb assumption, but... Was she the fucking, um... Character that was writing in the book about her daughter? And the candy mare is her daughter? Does anyone know? Or is that going to is is has that been answered for me already and I'm just and and, I, and I'm just an idiot. Does anyone know? Cuz like I don't know what that mayor's purpose was in this story. I don't know why she was there. The only thing that that tells me that she could be that the reason that she could be there is that if she was the candy mare's mother and she was just sticking around because she loves her daughter and she can't come to terms with the fact that her daughter is a monster, but... I guess so, and this is all a play? That That's also another thing am I, <laughs> that I'm wondering. Or is this... Am I watching the play right now? Or are me and Star Swirl watching the same thing? Narrator Scribbler, Star Swirl Vulk in a box, Strawberry Patch Cloud Nine, okay Cloud Nine, Gretel, Starry Flame, Hansel, Optic Rainfall, Candy Mare, Rena Silverstone, I've never heard of you before. Content warning voice Goombasa, that's why you sound familiar. Give it up for the artists. They work really hard. That is not me being sarcastic. I love some of the art and Scribbler stuff. Oh, boy. All right. Check out my other videos. I shall, but I've already seen this. I've, and I will watch Friendship is Tragic 2 momentarily in the future at some point. Right now, I have to watch Chapter 2.
It's so hard not to spoil this and the sequel for you guys, but I'll hold it until we get to it. All right, I need you to stay so you can freaking explain shit to me. The following video contains scenes of graphic violence. Viewer discretion is advised. Why does this Christmas theme go so hard? This came out in 2020? So far, it seemed that the performance was well received. Luna and Celestia certainly seem to have been absorbed by the story, their uncomfortable expressions melting away as the tale had unfurled. Starsquill was glad of the break, as it gave him a chance to see how others in the crowded hall were reacting. It was clear that the play was already something of a hit with the rest of the crowd, as there were many excited whispers shared about what had been seen in hushed tones, while a few other ponies attended to more urgent matters, such as visiting the garderobe. That seemed to be where Smart Cookie and Chancellor Puddinghead had wandered off to, or perhaps to purchase some festive concessions from the vendors out in the street. Princess Platinum was taking the chance to chat with Princess Luna. Though the two had something of a shaky first meeting, they had since become fast friends. The Royal Unicorn had even gone so far as to fill the Castle of the Pony Sisters with many beautiful tapestries of exquisite quality. Starswell had to admit he had not expected the Alicorn sisters and the mildly spoiled unicorn to get along so well, but he was relieved to see that they were getting along just fine. Oh. Commander Hurricane still Luna as a friend as ever, either unable or stubbornly refusing to relax. But there had been a certain wistfulness to his eyes as he had watched the play. Starswell was almost certain he had seen the beginnings of a tear before they were quickly hidden by concealing feathers and an agitated sigh. He <laughs> heard Stars will to see his friend like this, but he knew better than to try and talk to him now. It was better to let the Pegasus deal with his grief in his own way, rather than to force his own advice on him like some old fool, no matter how much he wanted to do just that. Good call, on good the call. Other hoof, there was the matter of his apprentice. Clover the Clever had sulked all throughout the performance, one of the few in the audience that did not laugh at the well-told jokes, or even so much as gasp at the more harrowing twists and turns. It was true she had lived through the events this performance pantomimed. I don't think the Candy Mare story is the story that they're watching. I, I don't think I don't think they are watching the same thing we're watching. I think the story is just like they went to go see a play and everyone had fun, so. But that was not enough to account for her sullen nature. No, Starswell knew exactly what it was that occupied his star pupil's mind. Is the play not to your liking, Clover? I thought the simulated windigos you crafted were rather impressive. Starswell hazarded a brave sally that was met with a blank stare. The spell work must have been most intricate to shape simple life rather to such convincing shapes. What is this voice? What the is it? circles around Clover's eyes told a troubled tale about just how much sleep she hadn't been getting lately. Crafting convincing at Simulacra is easy when the particles are small enough. She smiled bitterly. Though even the short amount of work spent on this parlor trick seems like a heinous waste of our times and talents, as is this entire play, do I really need to stay here, Star Swirl? I think there are far more important things we could be doing at the moment, and I'm sure you agree. We've been over this, Clover, said Star Swirl, not unkindly. The break could do us both some good. Even if you refuse to rest your body, you should at least rest your mind. I find at times when I'm stumped, it sometimes helps to take a step back from the problem and allow my mind to consider other matters. Or perhaps to consider nothing at all. Sometimes the answer to a dilemma will occur out of the blue if you clear your mind. Obsessing like this isn't healthy. Obsessing? 
You think I'm obsessing? We've been working for weeks, side by side, and we're still no closer to a solution. Why wouldn't I be obsessing when the lives of every pony in Equestria may be on the line? Oh, uh, your voice, my apprentice. Reed on the line from the what? Unicorn harshly, a flash of magic suffusing his eyes, uncharacteristically stern. Realizing that others were turning their heads toward the outburst, he mollified his tone, but continued in a hushed volume. The crowd may be noisy. There are still those who are near enough to overhear. Do you really want to risk causing a panic in this crowded theater? I meant no offense to you. You are as dedicated as a true apprentice as an old fool like myself could ever hope for. But you must realize that you are not behaving like yourself. Her response was icy. Is that why you insisted I be here then? So you could tell me this in a crowded room where I wouldn't dare make a scene? I thought better of you. No, Clover. I wanted you to be here so you could see what you once were. Yes, I admit this performance is mere frivolity. But it chronicles an important period, not only in Equestria's history, but your own. I had hoped that seeing this would remind you of who you are, of the special things you had and still have, despite what you've lost. The hell's with the fanfare. A warning that the play was about to resume went out over the audience. There was a mild rush of the crowd to resume their seats, though the bustle of excitement seemed the furthest thing from Clover and Starswell at that moment. Your friends wouldn't want to see you this way. So absorbed in your work that you don't even have time to feel, to mourn. She most certainly wouldn't have wanted to see you ignore your own well-being for her sake. Clover what are we talking about? <laughs> floor, her eyes hidden by her hood and the fringe of her mane. Even so, Starswell thought he saw something glistening fall to the floor. I know. I know, okay? But there's nothing I can do for her now. I have to think. I'm sorry. I have to call attention to some of these messages in the chat. So Karma and Reggie are talking about the, the Candy Mare series. And I can't help but notice that Reggie said the last fic in the entire series is literally Candy Mare Goes to Hell. Which is just like Jason Goes to Hell. <laughs> it sounds like Jason Goes to Hell. And if I remember Jason Goes to Hell correctly, that is the movie in the Jason Voorhees franchise where they kill Jason, but it, his heart is alive and somebody eats his heart and then they become Jason, and then they die, and then somebody eats that heart, and then somebody becomes Jason. And I think at some point in the movie, Jason's heart becomes a creature. But then it becomes Jason, and then hands pull Jason into hell. So yeah, that's not one of the best. When it comes to Friday the 13th movies, that's not one of the best ones. Of Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I haven't seen Jason Goes to Hell in like, I don't know, 20 years probably. Pony else. We have to think of every pony else. I don't have time to selfishly fall apart, and it's wrong of you to suggest that I should. Every pony deals with these things in their own way. I know I might be distracting myself right now, but you have no right to tell me not to. I will grieve when this threat has been put to an end. In the meantime, if you have any more sage advice, I suggest that you start with Commander Hurricane. Unless you want a witch hunt on your hooves, that is. The old unicorn was taken aback. <laughs> Whatever do you mean? Sometimes, for all your wisdom, you're just as bad as I am when it comes to some things. Clover spoke with something approaching a smirk. You've had your head buried in that journal even more than I have, haven't you? How could any pony expect you to notice that the construction of Cloudsdale has been completely stalled? The Pegasi are busy with other matters these days, Star's World, and there's only a skeleton crew tending to Equestria's weather. And this cold? She turned puffy eyes up at her teacher. It's not entirely their doing, I'm afraid. Starswell had no time to consider the ramifications of what his apprentice had said before the lights were lowered and the play resumed. He couldn't help but stare hard at Commander Hurricane as the curtains were drawn back and the actors took the stage. 
It was true that his friend had been hurt, perhaps worse than any pony else by what had happened. But surely he would not abandon his duty to pursue some personal vendetta. That was nothing like... Okay, I can't lie. I'm like half paying attention to this conversation. Uh, I'm just more interested in Fluffy in the chat going, not going to spoil anything. Okay, don't spoil anything. But I need you to stay here at the end for when I have questions. Because I know I'm going to be confused about something because I am a dumbass. But I need you to stay. Was Jason Goes to Hell that bad? From what I remember, it's it's like... Let me put it this way. I'd rather watch Jason X than Jason Goes to Hell. I'd, I'd, put, I'd throw it to you like that. Like the loyal and dutiful Pegasus he had known. However... Where Jason X is goofy bad, J Jason Goes to Hell is just bad. The story was written by Knackerman. Okay, cool. As the actor who played the role of Private Pansy took the stage... A look came over the commander's face that Starswell had never seen before. It was there in a flash and gone in an instant, but it was unmistakable. It was a look less of wistfulness and more of intense regret, and perhaps more than a little longing. It was worse than, was it worse than Jason Takes Manhattan? I thought Jason Takes Manhattan was goofy bad. Just like how I thought Jason X was goofy bad. But Jason Goes to Hell is just bad. Or Jason versus Freddy. That is another one I thought was goofy bad. How much longer was she expected to live with this? She hated this creature. This candy mare. This thing that had pretended to be her daughter. I was right! ...in slaughtering children, in causing suffering and pain. She would destroy it if she could, but so far... I liked Freddy vs. Jason. I also liked Freddy vs. Jason, but it was like... The ending was kind of bullshit, though. The ending was kind of bullshit. That is the on my only gripe with Freddy vs. Jason, is that the ending was kind of bad. Everything else in Freddy vs. Jason was fine. She could not think of any way in which it could be done. What could you do to Candy to hurt it? So yeah, this is... This is the fucking... This is either like her... The Candy Mare's mother from the very beginning of this fic. Or this is like... This is like some other character caring for the Candy Mare. You know? Eat it? I think it's the first one though. You would just suffer the same fate as that poor little cult, turned <coughs> into a candy monstrosity destined to be devoured by the original at best, or, worse, used as a freakish puppet for her amusement. Burn it? She watched as bits of the candy mare's melted licorice hair rolled across the floor to rejoin its mistress. No, she had thought of every possible way she could to put an end to this living nightmare and come up with nothing even remotely worth trying. Honestly, she could not fathom why the monster did not simply devour her like all the others. Because you're its Instead, mother. Instead, she did horrible things like this. The table was set for two, but the candy mare's plate was already empty, save for smears of fresh blood. Her own, of course, was still full. She knew that she could not keep stalling. She could see it in the candy mare's eyes as they leered at her from beneath her writhing mane. She was expected to eat. If she didn't soon, the cruel creature would force her. The little filly was still alive, if you could call her sorry state a form of life. Bits and pieces of her squirmed energetically on the dinner plate, her charred body having been skillfully chopped up and served wriggling in a gravy made from her own boiling blood. Okay, that seems like a fate worse than death. Remember earlier when I was like, it takes you long to die? Apparently, from what I'm understanding in this instance, is that she didn't die at all. Like, she's, she's still alive. She's just in terrible, terrible agony. <laughs> because she just got put in an oven 
got cooked alive and just served and she's still alive. That is a fate worse than death by like a factor of a thousand. The candy mare had made sure to carve off a large hunk of the living dead pony's flank, pink juices seeping from the steaming flesh, threatening to spill over the thin plate. Eat up. It's getting colder outside. You need it to keep up your strength. This little filly, bathed in the flames of a thousand souls, has been imbued with a portion of- What the fuck is this? What am I about to see? Am I about to see Hansel's severed head or Gretel's severed head or whatever? Even though her whole body was burned in the stove? Uh... Uh... To kill or even destroy candy, maybe use salt. Salt? I'm just imagining like some, like the candy mare walks up to you and is trying to kill you, but you use the fucking pocket sand technique, but it's salt. So you go, pocket salt, and you throw it in the candy mare's face, and she's like, oh god, the pocket salt. And then you just run away. Of my life force. It should be enough to give you back a little of the health you've lost. Trying is that to really the you? head? Are you going to show me she like the head with an apple in it? Now. It had not been the first time. She had tried to just die, to succumb to hunger so many times, but the candy mare would not let her. She didn't know how many times she had tried, but her body was starting to rebel. The hunger pains and the delirium they brought were beginning to weigh heavily on the old mare. Though a bit of the little girl squirmed on the end of her fork, she couldn't bring the morsel of flesh to her lips. Hey, Shin Godzilla. Her, the horrid meat did smell good. It had all smelled good when it was served to her in steaming bowls of stew. Why had she not realized back then what she had been doing? The candy mare had not let her leave the cottage in weeks, only leaving her alone long enough to go out and lure back more meat for their larder. This <sighs> was not the first child served like this to her on a silver platter. Why do you keep doing this? You know, I don't want to eat this. You. So I was right. It, it's the mom. It's the mom from the beginning. It was like, I found my daughter. She got back, but she's not my daughter. She got possessed by something, so on and so forth. My cabbage headed husband, something, something. So yeah, it's the same character. Oh, Damn, that's your daughter. Kind of wish you would watch something sweet to bite right after this, but that would be too much. Maybe in the future. Maybe in the future. I mean, that's the sequel, right? So at some point I got to watch that, but just not not in October because I already have a like a whole set of other things I want to react to in October. So maybe, I don't know. If it's still like Christmas themed, I could do it for Christmas. That's only because you haven't given it a chance. The fiend grinned. I didn't think I would like it either, but the taste grew on me in time. I was tricked the first time I ever ate any pony, you know? I have to say, the flavor isn't that different, raw or cooked, but... How does she have tears and she doesn't have any eyes? At that, the candy mare took a delicate bite of a portion of the charred filly's shoulder. Gretel's decapitated head... That is a fat eyeball. Eyeless with a candy apple jammed in her mouth. She moaned softly around the bright red fruit. Charred lips pulled back over her teeth, still steaming. It was hard to tell if the unearthly sound was one of pain or pleasure, or even, perhaps, both. The old man... <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. She wait. kept hoping that insanity would grip. Idea. The old mare did not care to speculate. She kept hoping that insanity would grow. The old mare did not. Charred lips pulled back over her teeth, Listen. still steaming. It was hard to tell if the unearthly sound was one of pain or pleasure, or even perhaps both. The old mare did not. I have a question. Why would this be pleasure? <laughs> Why would this be pleasure? You're painting a very weird picture in my head right now, Scribbler. And I know you didn't write this, but, like, having an apple in your mouth like this 
and you're trying to insinuate that perhaps, maybe, that these moans are of pleasure? I don't like that. I don't like, I don't like that at all. It's like some, some, some weird ass, like, headless, eyeless thing moaning out of pleasure from having an apple in his mouth. I don't know. I, I can't. I can't be with you on that assessment. Not care to speculate. She kept hoping that insanity would grip her mind and leave her insensible to all the horror around her. Sadly, she had remained stubbornly sane. You're a monster! And yours to help us old mare starving to death in the heart of an unending winter! The candy mare slammed her hooves into the table. How many years has it been now? How many more will it be before you finally accept that I'm the only one who cares if you survive? The unicorns have abandoned this land. The Pegasi and other Earth ponies, too. There's no one who can save you but me. You this is why you should never go in the woods. This is why you should never go in the woods. You know how much fucked up shit goes on in, in the woods? Away from everybody and everything? Do you understand the kind of fuckery that goes down in the woods? Don't, if... Listen, if you move, just don't move towards the woods. Don't go towards the woods. You're gonna find dumb shit like this. You're not gonna you're not gonna see the candy mare, but you're gonna see like some fucked up shit. You know why? Mother, why won't you let me just take care of you? I am not your mother. I, You're the reason. I gotta say, I do love the setup of this picture. Not so much the fucking, uh, the gory setup, but I do love the candy mare's eyes over the, over the carcass of the head. I do love that. Val, where are you? They disappear. My husband. My little girl. I figured it out. It was you who killed your You're cabbage headed husband that made them disappear you're so sure of that are you <laughs> though from the expression on her sugar dusted face it did not seem like she thought it was very funny every pony knows you're responsible for the disappearances at the castle town just tell me what happened to them did you kill them? Did you eat, eat them? them? Yeah, there you go. The old mare paused, hoping against hope that somehow they had been spared that misery. Sadly, she could not doubt such a fate. I wouldn't be surprised. Or did they escape you? Did you leave them? Cowering in some hole somewhere for a late night snack? Just tell me what happened to Cabbage and Pumpkin Patch? The candy mare's eyes flickered, and the life seemed to fade from her. Her mane hung limp from her sugar skull, and she did her not sugar so skull pitch. piece by piece. The candy that coated the cottage was stripped away, flowing back into her body. Soon, the kitchen was dark and lonely, the only light coming from the banked embers in the very normal-looking stove. With the candy coating now removed, the old mare could see the sticky blood that coated every surface, though if it belonged to the candy mare, or to the innocents she had slaughtered, it was impossible to say. Even the light from the kitchen window was washed a crimson hue as the fading light outside just barely managed to seep through the scarlet stains. The red glow spread over the monster that sat shivering at the dinner table, as bit by bit the candy that composed her body turned within. This was not anything the old mare had ever seen her do before. As the candy continued to peel away, she could see tiny misshapen hooves, pale skin 
stretched over a bony form and a listless red mane that hung in greasy strips from a tiny, shrunken skull. Her eyes, bright green and almost glowing in the dying light from the window, turned to the old mare and made her breath catch in her throat. <laughs> this could not be. Her daughter? You want to know what happened to me and Daddy so badly? Whispered the broken child sadly. Well, okay. Fine. Yeah. I'll tell you, Mama. We went to the castle town. It was everything I had ever imagined. But the pony Daddy and I were supposed to meet. He was very, very bad. He took me away from Daddy. And okay. Forced me to do things. Oh, don't I tell me that. Not talk about. Oh, I hate that. The things that I'd rather not talk about is him forcing me to eat Daddy. Oh no! Him and left him in a rotting midden heap like a dead dog. But that didn't stop him from carving Daddy up and serving him to me. Her eyes flickered oh, again. I hate that. this world madness threatening to crawl back into them. She shook herself and continued. He had done so many horrible things to me. He rotted my teeth. He rotted my mind. He rotted my body. But being tricked into eating daddy, that was too much for me to take. Do you want to know what the worst part is? No molestation. It taste half bad. Oh, thank God. <laughs> I was so ashamed. I'm sitting here like, no molestation, no molestation. I had been forced to do. Eating pony flesh. Even that of my father was I mean... actually enjoyable. <laughs> They say that, like, eating people just tastes like chicken. That's what they say. I don't know if that's true, chat. Don't take me out of context, but every cannibal's records is like, whenever they eat people, they're like, it just tastes like chicken. It, it doesn't, it's not, like, revolting. The most revolting part about eating another person is that the realization that you're just eating another person, so. I like this. If you put if you put it out of your head that you're eating a person and you're just tricking yourself into eating meat, then you can do it. <laughs> a deep, terrifying groan rose from the old timbers of the rotting cottage. At first, the old mare thought the house was on the verge of collapsing, before she realized that the sound was coming from her own mouth. Her oh, you poor thing. Frozen. She did not want to believe, did not want to think it was true. But the evidence sat shivering right in front of her, bereft of the bright colored mantle it wore to conceal itself from the rest of the world. Her husband had died cruelly, but that was merciful compared to her daughter's fate. <laughs> I got a taste for it then. And, as you know, <laughs> Daddy was only the first pony I ate. That bad unicorn kept pushing me, experimenting on me, trying to break me. <laughs> but I was already broken. So... I ate, I ate, I ate, and I ate to grow strong. The more I ate, the stronger I got. And then I ate that pitiful, rancid, little unicorn's life. But I couldn't stop there, Mother. You were right. <laughs> the unicorns don't care about us. The Pegasi wanted to defend us. 
and our fellow Earth ponies were content to turn a blind eye to all the injustice that we suffered instead of trying to help us or even help themselves. This is what happens. Why not kill them? This is what happens when you live in a society that does not give a shit about you. Hashtag Joker quotes. Why not eat them too? Why not grow strong off the lives of all those terrible ponies? What picture am I about to see? Why should we suffer in the cold and the dark when we can live and live and live and live to kill them all? We can make them suffer the same way we were made to suffer. Literally the Joker. Candy and light flooded the cottage again as the sugar coating crept back out of her daughter's dead form and engulfed the room. Warmth and sweet scents and terrible laughter oh the old mare from all sides. The candy mare's fragile body, sheathed in sweets once more, rose from where she had been sitting and came to her mother's side. Her daughter came to her side. The smile on her little girl's new face was at once predatory and pleading. You see now, don't you, mother? We have to eat to grow strong. We have to make them pay for everything they've done to us. I know what the unicorns did to Grandma. How you came to hate them for having forced you on her. For making her bear the bastard daughter of the master of the house. Wait a minute, you what? Wait a minute, what? Back up, wait, hold up, wait, nope, up, oh, hold up, wait, back, hold, wait, hold up, wait, what? Say that again? For making her bear the bastard daughter of the master of the house. Well, that makes you me uncomfortable. You were right to hate them. And it's that hatred that will make you strong. The more I feed you, the more you eat. And very soon, you'll be just like me. <laughs> Those last words froze the blood in the old mare's heart. The moan in her throat turned into a rattling rasp as all the air left her lungs. The decapitated head on the serving plate seemed to look up at her with blind pity. Even without eyes, the dead could see just how terrible the fate that her own daughter had planned out for her truly was. It was true, she had always hated the unicorns and pegasi, but each of the tribes had hated the others. It had always been that way. Though her daughter had been sweet and innocent, it was that hatred that had helped poison and twist her, that had helped to shape her into the creature she was now. Mm. She was her mother's daughter, after all, and the sick irony was not lost on Strawberry Patch. A sharp stab in her chest, a wave of panic, and then a sigh of relief. This revelation had been too much for the old pony's heart to take. She died. She slumped forward in her chair. <coughs> she died. Mother? The candy coated filly nuzzled her mother's side oh no she she is about to go ape shit when she figures out her plan didn't work when she just died from fucking stress she is about to go batshit insane mother, the food's getting cold. this is no time to nap please didn't you hear what i said before oh she's gone you she is live. gone you have to eat. You have to. Mother? Mother? Oh, no.
Everything's just going to shit. Everything's just going to shit. I mean, <laughs> this is going to be a it's going to be a strange take. This is going to be a really weird take, but I she she could have killed her mother right off the rip. The fact that she kept her around for that long is like she obviously loves her mom. And she didn't intend for things to end up the way this did, right? Like, she, she's a product of what happened to her. That's no excuse, by the way. That's no excuse to turn into a, a fucking otherworldly candy-based beast. But I just want to point out that she is like this because of what happened to her. She didn't wake up one day and was like, I'm just going to become evil. No, that's not what happened. She was, she, she was fucked with as, as a child and that, that breeds more hatred. So it's like, <laughs> I, I, I think that, um, her losing her mom in that moment is sad, but also deserved. So, you know. Jesus Christ, I can't wait to see you die. But first of all, when you think of it, it's her mom's fault. Pumpkin Patch was content with living alone and eating anyone who came into her house. But she had to die and make her sad and angry and made her go crazy. Eh, that's one way to look at it. Fuck that bitch for dying. How dare you die and all my homies hate dying. Didn't wail, cut through the snowy stillness, causing Private Pansy to shiver. Private the Pansy raged for the better part of a day and a night now. It was beginning to slacken. Okay, first of all, Private Pansy is gorgeous. I love her eyes, I love her little hat, I love her mane. Don't kill Private Pansy. Is Private Pansy gonna die? She's gonna die, isn't she? Fuck she ah oh, god damn. I'm falling in love with Private Pansy. Commander only for Scribbler to rip her away from me. The hurricane had charged this platoon of Pegasi with the evacuation effort, and storm or no storm, they would do their duty. Though they had been able to subdue the Windigos in the newfound nation of Equestria, they seemed to be far too numerous and powerful here in the northern farmlands to drive away completely. Private Pansy did not really want to think about what that must mean about the hatred and distrust the simple farm folk must feel for the other pony tribes. She was only here to observe the proceedings on the commander's orders and to remind the other troops that they were supposed to treat the earth ponies with kindness, tolerance, and friendship when possible. It had been hard enough convincing the earth ponies they could trust the Pegasus platoon. The only interaction many of them had ever had with a Pegasus before were the sometimes harsh negotiations over weather and crop yields. Private Pansy had thought many times before the Troubles that it seemed rather silly to threaten to restrict the farmer's ability to grow food unless they provided a large share of that selfsame food supply to the Pegasi. Mm. Obviously, they had no choice but to comply. But what if they hadn't? What if they had all refused to share any food, or even to grow it, so long as the Pegasi made such demands? They would have all starved. It really wasn't any wonder the Windigos had come to bedevil the pony tribes. Thinking about it, it was no surprise they'd been thickest around the ponies who had been the most downtrodden, who had the most reason to hate the other tribes. It made Pansy's heart ache if she thought about it too much. Still... Such thoughts put things in perspective when, during a particularly nasty squall, the troop had approached a small wagon to render aid, and their diving out of the air had caused the simple farmers to respond with panic. While it was true that visibility was poor, once they established that they were no threat, the earth ponies had still been very angry and distraught. Apparently, in the commotion, their children had run away to escape the perceived threat, and now had likely become lost in the forest. They had been searching for a night and the best Don't part live of the next, next day, to a forest! To find the lost tots and reunite them with their parents. Many of the Pegasi soldiers God, were grumbling I... that the. All my homies hate the forest. We all hate the forest. The whole thing was a farce, 
and that there were no children, and this was just a wild goose chase, the Earth Pony's idea of a joke. Private Pansy, for her part, felt that the parents' distress was genuine. No one would cry as they had in this cold if they could keep from it, lest they lose part of their face to frostbite. <gasps> Lost in her thoughts, Private Pansy had found herself wandering away from the rest of the platoon and deeper into the darkening woods. Why? The whale cut through the frosty forest. Though it Stop! sounded less unearthly than before, this time it was followed swiftly by a new sound. The distant, warbling sobs of a crying child. It must be the little lost children, Pansy thought to herself. Oh, she's gonna but die. She's gonna she die so in a rare road uh. in the storm. She had better call the others. But when she tried to retrace her steps, she found that no other Pegasi were nearby. Flying above the forest canopy did no good either, as though the storm had slackened, visibility was still poor above the tree line. For better or worse, Private Pansy would have to rescue the children on her own. Stealing what courage she could muster, the slight Pegasus pressed deeper into the forest until she came to a wide clearing. Everything was coated in thick, ancient snowdrifts, save for a distant, dilapidated farmhouse. That struck Pansy as odd, given how the storm had raged before. Even a truly industrious pony would not have been able to clear off a cottage of even this small size without constant vigilance. Given the abandoned and disheveled appearance of the warped timbers, it was unlikely any pony had cared for the house in some time. Even so, there it was again, the distant sounds of children weeping caught on a gust of frigid wind. It wasn't so distant anymore. She flew over the crust of snow and landed in front of the cabin door. Sure enough, she could hear the crying, slightly muffled, just on the other side of the door. Not wanting to startle any pony, she politely knocked. <clears throat> Hello? Pegasus Patrol? Any pony home? Hear me out. She's a snack. I don't want her to be a snack unless you're saying that, like, like, you know that thing that you say to the people who you think are cute is like, damn, baby, you look like a snack. And she does look like a snack. Believe me. She's very adorable. But I don't want, in this context, it, it doesn't sound like a, it doesn't sound like a, like a flirt. It sounds like a threat. Dude, you wouldn't last in the rural side of Texas. Probably not. You're not even, like, you're hitting the nail on the head with that one. Going alone, see, this is why I hate horror stories. They have to make characters into idiots. I don't think horror stories would get very far if they didn't at least have some dumb characters. Because, like, I want to watch a YouTube series. There has to be a YouTube series somewhere on YouTube that's, like, if horror stories were realistic... If, like, the characters were just a little smarter, like, they had average intelligence than the characters in any horror story ever made. Because it's got to be entertaining, and I don't think, like, I don't think, like, the dude foiling the, the villain's plan within the first, I don't know, ten minutes of the film is that entertaining. At least not by Hollywood standards. Oh, she finna be, be a snack, all right? Stop saying that. I don't want her to be a snack. I want her to get out alive. She's not going to get out alive. But I want her to get out alive. Hello? Are you okay in there? A what? A thought crossed Pansy's mind about abandoned shacks and crying children. She banged louder this time. I warn you. If you hurt any pony, it will go easier for you if you give up yourself peacefully. I don't have there a weapon no or anything. I'm just shouting. Even the sobs seemed to have paused before resuming their steady cadence. Pansy reached out to knock again and was surprised when the door creaked open under her hoof. Inside, the farmhouse was cold and just <sighs> as ramshackle as the outside. Knickknacks and other bric-a-brac 
cluttered, broken, and stained furniture. Here and there, the remnants of a picture frame still hung on the wall, though whatever scene the frames once held Here we seemed fucking to have been go. torn to shreds long ago. The peeling wallpaper and dusty floor were covered here and there with dark, unidentifiable stains that Pansy did not want to Unidentifiable the stains! smelled awful. She found herself suddenly wishing she had tried harder to find the rest of the platoon. Maybe the best course of action was to step back outside the cottage door and go get some backup. After all, who knew how many ponies could be lurking in the murky depths of the farmhouse? Who knew what they might do to Pansy if they caught her? A sudden, heartbreaking wail made Pansy's decision for her. Without hesitation, she bounded down the hallway and into what seemed like it had once been a kitchen. It was hard to tell under all the blood. Floor to ceiling, wall to wall, the entire room seemed to be drenched in blood, both old and new. <sighs> Even the windows were soaked, lending a sanguine light to the room from the fitful illumination outside. The ran Is that a freshly baked pie? In the middle of this blood gore den, there's just a freshly baked pie sitting on the windowsill. One of these things does not belong here. Rancid, rotting scent hit Pansy like a punch to the nose, making her gag and her eyes water. There were still bits and pieces of something wriggling in the scarlet mess. Bizarrely, there was a table, perfectly set for two, with knives and forks neatly arranged around bloody serving dishes and plates. Only this table seemed to have remained untouched by whatever had happened in this room. The table, and the tiny sobbing form that was curled up beneath it. <coughs> Mama! Mama! Hello? Are you okay? Pansy tried not to gag. <laughs> Are you Gretel? Or... <laughs> oh my god, this is... I can't... <laughs> As gruesome as this scene is, I can't get over the pie on the windowsill. Who drew this? Who drew this? Who drew this scene in particular? Because whoever drew this thinks they're a goddamn comedian. Ansel, your, your parents are worried sick about you. They've sent me to bring you home. This is not Hansel and Gretel. This is, this is, she, I know you don't know this, ma'am, but she is the cause for all of this. She's not going to tell you. She might actually eat you, but we'll see what happens. The crying only increased. Oh, my God. Soft sobs giving way to wails once more. I like the, I like the butcher knife in the table, though. That's dope. We should dope. get you out of here. There's no telling when the ponies who own this place might be back. We need to hurry. I, I lost her. It's okay. I can get you back to your mother. Everything is going You have no fine. idea what's happening. No, it's not! Screamed the child as its head twisted all the way around to glare at Pansy with blazing hot eye sockets. <laughs> Thick red tendrils, like writhing worms, spilled out from the eyeless void, reaching toward the startled Pegasus. Only her military training kept her from being snatched by the grasping crimson tethers. Nothing will ever be fine again! Exploded the filly, howling in many voices. Her tiny body ripped and tore as something burst forth from within, shredding to pieces the rotten and dead corpse of a little filly from inside out. A sugary scent. That is some parasite shit. That really is some parasite shit. She was a little foal and then like this thing comes out of her back. So that indicates that like she's probably never going to turn into the little foal version of herself ever again. This is, this is, <laughs> it's like you, you have never, you, <coughs> it's like. Wait until I reach my final form, and this is her final form, essentially. 
mixed with the stench of rotting meat and putrefied blood, filled the room as a grown mare made of candy flipped the table and sent it shattering to splinters against the wall. Jesus Christ. My father, my mother, they both abandoned me. Left Your mom died from stress? In this rotten world. I'm just, bro, I'm just happy like her mom got out like at all like i'm ha i'm happy that she had found peace or whatever rotten people i tried to be a good person i tried to protect her but she died just the same just like everyone else in this filthy rotten world oh boy Rainbow colored tears gathered at the corners of the creature's lollipop eyes Pansy was frozen in place. The torrents of sheer madness and despair rolling off this creature shook her to her very core. Despair? She what is this, Duncan Rumpel? Of the candy mare, of course, but like most Pegasi, she had dismissed it as some kind of earth pony urban legend, a way of explaining away loved ones lost in the cold. She had always hoped it was ponies leaving for warmer climates or, at worst, becoming tragically lost in a sudden whiteout. She had never considered that such a blood-soaked monstrosity could really be at the heart of the Nightmare Night legend. Jesus. The beast. <laughs> We're going to get back to this in a second. Uh, Karma says, and your father didn't abandon you, they died. Yeah, that is a good point. But here's the thing. Whatever, whatever unicorn captured her or captured them, it forced her to eat her own dad, which is a situation that is more fucked up than I can even imagine. So, I mean, we could, we could sit here and be like, whose fault is this? Who's to blame? I'm gonna, I'm gonna blame the unicorn that like kidnapped her and her father in the first place. Cause it said. It, it created this snowball effect that made everything so much worse than what it could have been, you know? ...seemed to be occupied with her own grief. If Pansy was careful, she might just be able to go back out of the kitchen, out of the house, out of the forest, and out of this country forever. One hind hoof moved to do just that and landed on a floorboard with a traitorous creak. It's because of ponies like you, Pegasi and unicorns. She is literally the Joker. Pegasi and unicorns. You all think you're so much better than- So you're telling me you killed those children on the subway? everyone else. I have a secret for you! <laughs> With blinding speed, the fiend slithered across the floor to stand right beside Pansy. She leaned in, sugary breath, hot and sweet, in Pansy's ear and nose. You all taste the same. <laughs> you all taste- Sharp She teeth. took her ear! The no, her cute little ear! At the root, leaving a bloody hole in the side of her head. She did not even register the pain, transfixed by the sight of the candy mare, slowly chewing the wad of flesh. It was not until her own blood dribbled down the side of her face and into the corner of her own mouth that she screamed in shock and pain. <laughs> she reeled backwards. She had to get away. She ran down the hallway, knocking over dusty end tables and chairs, trying to block the candy monster's pursuit. She need not have bothered. When she reached the living room, the sugar-coated nightmare was waiting for her with a bloody grin, blocking the door. Without hesitation, Pansy whirled and ran back the way she had come. There was another door. She had seen it in the kitchen. She did not know how the candy mare had beaten her to the living room, but right now, that was the only other way out. The floor itself seemed to conspire against her, turning sticky and gooey beneath her hooves. 
With a surge of her wings, she pulled herself loose, only to see that it was not just the floor, but the walls and ceiling as well that seemed to be melting around her. She had to land again, or run the risk of being crushed. Barely making it back to the blood-stained kitchen once again, she froze dead in her tracks. There was a pony in a chair, but it was not the candy mare. She looked old, haggard, and, from the glaze of her milky eyes, very dead. Yeah, I... Had she been sitting at the table the entire time? Yes! Something caught Pansy's eye. What? A book that poked from the ruffles of the dead pony's dress. Despite her peril, the book seemed somehow important to Pansy, as if it were calling out to her. She reached out. Just as she laid a single hoof upon it, a riot of laughter shook the cottage. <laughs> oh boy, we're gonna need that book Wars for the evidence locker. Seemed to stretch and melt all around her, like the images in a funhouse mirror. Without warning, the kitchen floor fell away, opening like a massive mouth, splintered timbers serving as the jagged fangs of the gaping moor. Well, there was no then. time to react. Pansy tumbled into the darkness, sure that at any moment she was going to crack her skull or break her spine. Instead, she had an unexpectedly gentle landing. The dank basement she had fallen into was without illumination, so before her eyes could adjust, the first thing to assault her was the stench. It was the same rotting scent she had smelled before, only now it rose up and surrounded her. It was strange and spicy, salty almost, terribly bitter and foul. As her eyes adjusted to the gloom, she could see why. The cellar was full of dead bodies. Fillies and foals, mostly, though a few colts and stallions hung from hooks on the walls. More corpses were scattered at her hooves. These, apparently, had been responsible for her soft landing. Pansy recoiled in terror. She had been a seasoned veteran for many years now, though she had intentionally avoided any promotion in rank, afraid of the responsibility and preferring her role as Commander Hurricane's liaison and confidant. Yet never, in all her years, in all the battles that she had witnessed, had she seen so many corpses in one place. I was trained for war, but I was not trained for this. The empty eye sockets of preserved skulls gazed up at her piteously. She could see where some ponies had been pickled and others coated in salt to preserve their flesh. Some ponies have been pickled and others have been uh, coated in salt to preserve... They're flesh. <laughs> Just in case you didn't hear them the first time. Pansy realized with a lurch in her stomach that she had landed in the monster's larder. As if conjured by that thought, the candy mare appeared, a high-pitched giggle bubbling from her sugar-frosted lips. Listen, I need you to stop hyperventilating. The snake-like whips that served as her mane raised knives cleavers, and other carving implements that glittered cruelly in the dark. Pansy had no doubt that those blades were razor-honed. She saw now what fate lay in store for her. There was a row of jars filled with delicate pegasus wings in some kind of source. Next to them were other organs, pieces of pony flesh far more disgusting to behold. But she could not take her eyes off those plucked appendages in their jars. She did not want parts of her body to be coated in spices and eaten as a snack when she died. Wait. Just wait. You don't, you don't have to do this. I, I swear. I will tell anyone about this. No, that is not your job. And all, we're also at, almost at the end of the video, so I'm expecting you to die very soon. Is this fluffy? Is Fluffy doing this voice? You could, you could just keep, keep, keep killing him. Oh, he needs a beard. That's what you want. I'll, I'll make sure no one comes to bother you. 
have no friends in high places and care to walk. We're banning this region anyway, so... This sounds <laughs> like Agent O' Fluffy. to be bandits, crooks, or hate mongers. Anyway, if, if you let me go, I'm sure I can make the authorities look the other way. No. <laughs> Just no. From the grin on her face and the glazed look in her glacé eyes, it did not seem like the candy mare was listening. The parts of the knives that weren't splattered with dark stains glistened in the dusky light. Please, please don't kill me. Pansy howled in desperation as she lifted the book high as a shield. She trembled, expecting to feel the cold kiss of serrated metal at any moment. It was a sensation that never came. No. No, I think... I think I have a better idea. A single tendril reached out and wrest the book from Pansy's shaking grasp. You will be my emissary. You will tell my story. That way, all will know what is coming for them. You will be my... You will tell them that I am coming. Messenger, so that all will know exactly what waits for them in the dark. The candy mare tucked the book into Pansy's saddlebag. Really? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I promise I'll do exactly as you say. Pansy looked around. There did not seem to be any way out of this terrible charnel cellar. She did not trust the way that the candy mare smiled at her. Only, how do I know this isn't just some trick? That I can trust you? That I'm not just... Just leading you to more victims? How do I know I am not tripping balls right now? wider, as a hole opened up in the roof high above. At that moment... The cold light spilling through this new skylight was the most welcome sight that Pansy had ever seen. You'll just have to decide that for yourself. <laughs> Did I deceive you? Or indulge you? Trick. Or... Treat. Okay, so she found a new mom or something. Okay, we're half we're halfway through this, boys. We gotta we gotta get to the end and see how this wraps up. Oh, that was Haley. Private Pansy is Haley. Fluffy, where are you? You said you were in this. She's probably in the later chapters. All right. Uh, quite the roller coaster so far. Really big roller coaster. We need to get into part three. Uh, I am going to try to find that right now, unless there's something at the end of this that I'm not seeing, or that I'm not aware of. Nope, it's just to check out the other videos thing. Alright, never mind. Uh, let's see. Ooh, boy. Okay. This is chapter three. It has Celestia and Luna in it, so there's this whole B plot with Morning. there's this whole B plot with um with um Star Swirl the Bearded and his apprentice. His apprentice is like there's a problem, and Star Swirl is like no, there isn't. Uh, <laughs> there's something wrong, and Star Swirl is like I'm working on it or some shit like that. I can't wait to see how this becomes. This is goddamn. This is very um. This is a very short chapter, but. All right, let's see how this wraps up. The following video contains scenes of graphic violence. 
Viewer discretion is advised. I thought Emo Gak read this read the story. I guess she read the sequel. Yeah, Emo Gak read the sequel. I was looking around on YouTube and Emo Emo Gak has done the other part of this. Chapter three. Chapter three of four. Let's go. There was so much to keep track of these days. This new nation, Equestria, was one founded on love and tolerance. The tribes had found that, with their new bonds of friendship and understanding, they could be far stronger and mm. secure, working together for the greater good. That did not mean all of their problems were going to disappear overnight, nor that there weren't any... Well, technically, this is a sequel to that, but this takes place way before those events. So it's usually like... It's like whenever a movie comes out, but then, like, the next movie is technically the sequel, but it, it, it's a prequel, actually. So it, it's a sequel in the sense that it's, it's the movie that came out after the first movie, but in story terms... This story is how the first movie came to be, essentially. New problems on the horizon. Commander Hurricane had been receiving reports of griffins being spotted probing Pegasus airspace. While they might just be testing their <laughs> I don't borders know now. why. I don't know why. As soon as I heard the term griffins probing, uh, in my head I was like, Pegasus asses? And it was really close to Pegasus asses, and I'm very happy that that was the case. The commander knew how the griffins thought. <laughs> if they suspected any weakness, they would not hesitate to try and take more territory for themselves, regardless of if they really needed it or not. It's going by Star Wars logic. Yeah, it's, it's telling a story. It's just telling it backwards, I guess. There had been a long-standing treaty between the Griffins and the Pegasi over no flight zones and what counted as international airspace. But it was possible that, with their abandonment of their former cloud cities for the newly constructed Cloudsdale, that the Griffins held those treaties to be null and void. Not gonna lie, I forgot there was a play going on. Bruh, that's what, that's the, like, most confusing part about this audio play is, like, obviously in this chapter, this is where shit hits the fan for the B-plot, but it's like, how the fuck am I supposed to pay attention to this play B-plot when there's another plot going on with the candy mare in it? Obviously one story, obviously story A is more important than story B, or at least ent more enticing. Because I got to tell you, I do not give a fiddler's fuck as to what Star Swirl is doing. I'm more interested in the Candy Mare by, by a factor of a thousand. Commander Hurricane had been discussing just such a possible development with his staff when Star Swirl the Bearded let himself into the room. At first, the more militaristic Pegasus had thought the old unicorn something of a fool, what with the bells sewn into the brim of his hat, and the colorful motley costume he wore. I'm Most sorry, sir, you lost. Extravagances that the more pragmatic Pegasi found distasteful, but Starswell was in a class all by himself. It had come as a shock to the commander when he found out that the old fellow was not only the most powerful and accomplished magician in King Bullion's unicorn court, <laughs> most but was accomplished also kind, magician. respectful, and of a keen strategic mind. It was Starswell who had foreseen that Equestria could not survive if the tribes continued to be divided and would simply fall back into their old, segregated ways if left to self-rule. As such, Commander Hurricane, King Bullion, and the good Chancellor Puddinghead had agreed to submit themselves to a ruler who would have sovereignty over them all. A pony who would be charged with the stewardship and protection of each tribe and all of Equestria in the years to come. It had also been Starswell's genius to seek out such rulers from the Alicorns, one of the most long-lived and powerful races who embodied the best qualities of Unicorn, Pegasus, and Earth Ponies. 
They had not one, but two such rulers now in the Pony Sisters, Celestia and Luna. Though young, they carried themselves with a dignity that even King Bullion's daughter, Princess Platinum, had grown to respect. <laughs> Hello, old friend. How goes the weather committee? <laughs> Have you had a chance to attend the plans for the weather factories yet? Asked the bearded wizard. I see you got By a Jove, my trip. good chap! Perhaps you're looking for a good source of water. <laughs> that caught me off guard, I'm I sorry. I have an idea I'd like to propose about using a different tribe's water source each year, so that no one tribe would suffer a potential drought. Only, oh, it seems these aren't my blueprints at all. They appear to be maps and drawings of the Griffin Kingdom. Yes. My dear commander, I hope you weren't planning some sort of military action on your own. Nothing of the sort. Starswell arched an eyebrow. Hurricane hastily rolled up the map of Gregor Griffin's private keep. Merely discussing measures to secure Equestria's airspace, with all due caution, of course. There had been a time that if a unicorn had suggested the commander of any impropriety, no matter how small, he would have launched into an angry rage. He had learned a valuable lesson about keeping his more negative emotions in check, and having such a relapse now, in front of so venerable a friend, was out of the question. As such, he merely smiled. I'm afraid we haven't gotten around to viewing your plans yet, old friend. But we'll get to that just as soon as Private Pansy joins us. I'm awaiting her report about the ongoing evacuations from the North so that we can better gauge the size of our potential workforce. A most prudent idea, Commander. I should have expected nothing less. <laughs> Pardon me for my suspicious mind. I'm afraid it's difficult for even a unicorn like myself to shake the hereditary distrust of the Pegasus Tritoxy. Starswell removed his hat with a jingle of bells and bowed, showing that his apology was genuine and his last words were meant in jest. Commander Hurricane could not help but observe that for all his immense magical prowess, Starswell did behave something like a jester or fool from time to time. Will you react to History Repeats at some point? At some point. I gotta wait until Scribbler releases more chapters. You know what, funny fact, uh, I asked Scribbler how, um, how many chapters is, is gonna be Friendship is Tragic 2. Or rather, I didn't ask her. She just told me that it was going to be 22 chapters. And I'm still kind of sitting here wondering, how the fuck am I going to react to that? <laughs> that, is, that is so many videos in one story. And that's something that Scribbler wrote, right? She wrote Friendship is Tragic, which is why it goes on for so long. It's like, it's not a bad thing. It's, it's Scribbler, so, like, she she wants to write a lot, and she loves writing, but, like, I will re react to History Repeats at some point. I just gotta wait for her to come out with more... with more portions of that, you know? But it was only to put friends at ease. The Pegasus also knew that he could also effectively make enemies underestimate the Unicorn, much to their later regret. The doors to the meeting room burst open <laughs> as a oh pair God, of what happened? and a unicorn rushed in. The commander recognized Clover the Clever, Princess Platinum's advisor and a close friend. Starswell, you have to come quick. It's Pansy. What? What's this about Private Pansy? Hurricane's heart sank as he looked at the face of Starswell's apprentice. What's happened? I'm not sure, Commander, but she's been injured. She was on her way to report to you and she collapsed. The unicorn turned her worried gaze to her mentor. But I fear it's no ordinary wound. I sense dark magic has infected her. The same that wiped out one of the unicorn settlements 30 years ago. Starswell's face darkened. Take me to her. We haven't a moment to lose. Maybe you should react to hard reset. I didn't even know hard reset was a thing, but I'll look it up. What about Silent Equestria? I assume you mean Silent Ponyville, and I've already watched that on my own time. It's really good. Uh, I think that's on Goody's channel. 
that has Pinkie Pie in it. And I think out of all the Grim Darks I've watched, I think Silent Ponyville has my favorite ending to any Grim Dark. Because it's not a Grim Dark ending. Like there's actually a happy ending to Silent Ponyville. Private Pansy writhed beneath the sheets. The medics had tried their best to make her comfortable after stitching What the, the hell happened to you? Pain, but she had quickly developed a fever. Worse, she had started coughing up blood and bile, so that now the sheets weren't only soaked with sweat, but splattered with scarlet stains as well. Starswirl entered the room in a whirl of his starry robes. Horn instantly Who drew the this? As the glow of a powerful... Who drew this? <laughs> this is so good! The spell enveloped the injured Pegasus. He consulted with the medics while Clover moved to her friend's side. Hurricane wasn't far behind. Blast it all. I'm in charge here. Some pony tell me what's going on. What's happened to my liaison? His voice. 20 chapters. That might be the longest Grimdar thick ever on YouTube. I mean, if anybody can pull it off, it's going to be Scribbler, right? He broke as his eyes fell on the state of the sheets. What is wrong with my friend? No pony really knows. Clover placed one hoof over the glowing magic shell that now encased Pansy. We've been studying cases when we can, but it's rare to come across any survivors. There were many when it first surfaced, but none lasted for more than a day before... Well, before they had to be destroyed. We've been researching what we can about potential cures, but without a stable subject to try them on, it's impossible to know if they'll be effective. How are you looking for cures when you don't even know what's wrong with her? So far, none of the subjects have been stable. The spell I've cast will only slow the spread of the curse. But given her condition... The spread of the curse? Even with my spells, it's only a matter of time. Curse? Only a matter of time? Until what? Yeah, Spit I'm with out, him! Sir. If this is some new threat to Equestria, as its military commander, it is my right to know. Imagine seeing someone vomit up blood and bile and then being like this is the threat to the world <laughs> i would just assume that it would be somebody just throwing up blood and bile I, I wouldn't think it would be a threat to the world but now that you've said that i think things are more dire than they look to be starswell frowned he motioned for the medics to leave the room and closed the door behind them he did not stop there moving to the tower window and securing the shutters to be sure no passing Pegasus might eavesdrop. With just Clover, Hurricane, and himself in the room with the afflicted pansy, the bearded unicorn lit a few candles to provide a fitful sort of illumination. What do you know, it's only old a man? Of time, Commander, until we lose poor pansy in more ways than one. She is under the sway of a dire curse that saps the life from Earth Pony, Pegasus, and Unicorn alike. We've tried to keep this under wraps to prevent a panic from spreading through the populace. How did this happen? More advanced stages, uh, which I am sorry to say the pansy is on the verge of. The body is destroyed and replaced with a simulacrum that is possessed of nothing but a cruel and violent hunger. If there is anything you wish to say to a hurricane, I suggest you do so now. What the fu- <laughs> <laughs> Star Star Swirl is just like listen. Her time is up. I'm just trying to tell you. So if you're here to say goodbye, just say goodbye. The commander, for all his bravery. Things escalated so fast. I feel like there's a chunk of information that we we missed somewhere. Looked truly shaken. I mean, obviously this is like Candy Mare related, but I want to know why this is Candy Mare related. She... She can hear us? Can yes, she can hear you! Her ears aren't bleeding! Can she speak? Yes. The barrier is for our safety. Let's keep the curse from spreading. My spell work should have slowed the process sufficiently now that the worst of the pain is over. I only wish that I could do more. Starswell's brow knit in thought. Actually, Clover, 
Your teleportation spells have come along now, yes? You should be able to blink between here and the castle of the Royal Pony Sisters. Fetch the princesses as quickly as you can. Alicorn magic may succeed where unicorns has failed. Of course. I'll return as swiftly as I can. Is this the same pony that met with Candy Mare and she was like, tell my story? Because she looks like it. Is that the bit of information I'm missing? Unless this is a time skip. That's what I was assuming. I assumed that this was like a different pony altogether. But the more I look at her, the more I'm like, is that the pony that the Candy Mare was like, let them know, let them know I exist. Like, fucking tell my story. Because I read a comment in chat and then it all clicked for me, but... Clover vanished in a flash of violet light. Is there really hope, Star Swirl? Can the Royal Sisters truly help my poor pansy? Asked By blasting her, her to bits, all probably. All of control or command abandoned. I very much doubt it. As powerful as the princesses are, they are yet inexperienced in their abilities. They were recently blank flanks, after all. This is Pansy, yes? Oh my god, you're right, it is Pansy. Alright, if you want to show the harmony and trust for the three tribe, you have to tell them about the dangers you found. Well, Star Swirl is kind of a big doofus. While that means little when it concerns their maturity, it does mean they are still very much coming into their own. I merely sent Clover away, so she may be spared witnessing the end. Starswell gazed sadly at Pansy, and at that moment, he looked every bit as old as his many years. She's stirring, Commander. Now's your chance. Indeed, Pansy's eyes, closed tight as she had grimaced and groaned on the bed, fluttered open. She was beautiful beneath Starswell's shimmering spell. Swear to God, if this motherfucker looks this character in the eyes and goes, I've always loved you, I'm going to sh shut this whole stream down. But she had always been beautiful to Hurricane. Only rank and duty had kept the old warhorse from saying so. Something he never once had cause to regret. Until this day. This moment. Private. Pansy, can you hear me? I mean, she pain? has one ear, so... I... I was... Commander. She spoke slowly. <laughs> Star's world. Star swirl. Whatever. <laughs> Everything feels... Star Swirl does so not deserve to have his name spelled correctly. If Star Swirl goes to Starbucks and orders a coffee, they will spell his name on the cup wrong every single time. Not because they don't know how to spell it, but just out of disrespect. I wanted to see you. I needed to see you. For the I end. swear to God if this bitch... I heard what Master Starswell said. And I knew even... Even before he said it. What that monster... Has done to me. She... Tricked me. After all, I guess. Trick. Or. Tree. Who did this to you? Give me a name, Private. Give me well, a if name. If you don't have one, <laughs> give me a description, and I swear I'll bring the full might of the equestrian military down on them so fast they'll never know what hit them. Fire crep. What the fuck is the line from Taken where he's like, he's like, I, I, have, a, I have a very unique set of skills. I will find you, and I will kill you. And then he finds the candy mare, and then he ends up dying, obviously. Back into Hurricane's eyes. No! No, please don't! <coughs> you don't know what she's like. I had a chance to read her mother's journal on the journey here. It's in my saddle bag. <coughs> Hmm. He'll, he'll, he'll tell you everything you need to know. Her eyes welled with tears. It was clear that whatever time Starswell's spell had brought them was quickly drawing to a close. 
I think it's why she let me go. She wanted you and the others to have it. She, she wanted you to know what she is and what's no who is coming for you. Who? Who, my love? My Red love, he said it! Face lit up, shining almost brighter than the spell. The look of joy on her face was quickly replaced with one of anguish. She managed to choke the words out with a fresh spurt of blood from between her teeth. The candy man. Ugh. 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 Candy mare. <gasps> she writhed then. Her skin visibly stretching as something squirmed beneath her flesh. What? It started from the wound in the side of her head, spreading across her jaw. With a spurt, crimson tendrils shot from her mouth, breaking her jaw. Um, excuse me, ma'am. Thick red ropes. Oh God, I don't like that. Her flesh. A few strands hooked around Pansy's shattered mandible and twisted her head to the side. With the popping and snapping sound of bone grinding against bone, a voice that was not Pansy's own echoed from her ruined mouth and sang mockingly. You know, one of you in chat were like, I don't get how this villain works. I'm gonna, from this point onward, I'm just gonna say that this villain works on bullshit rules. Because... All we know about the Candy Mare is that, like, wh like she's not a shapeshifter, but she is a little girl. But she's able to take the form of, like, a house. She's able to, like, cause illusions. And it seems to me, like, whoever she bites or attacks, she can plant herself within that person and then spring from that character into her full form? Do I have that correct? I was expecting the candy mare to come like out of the forest, but apparently the candy mare planted herself inside of this character and, and just waited. Just waited for the perfect time to be like, uh, uh, all right, now's my chance. As soon as she says it, I'm going to introduce myself. Allow me to reintroduce myself. My name is Hove, and everybody, ah, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and we know if you eat her candy, you turn into a monster. Oh, yeah, that is another thing. You do turn into a monster. A monster that, like, there's no guarantee she won't eat you too, so... That is a disturbing image, though. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Strands of licorice shot from behind Pansy's eyes, popping them from their sockets. What the fuck are these black? Is that a USB cord? What the fuck is going on back there? So that they dangle. Oh, that's black licorice. All right, never mind. <laughs> the tendrils jammed themselves into the magical shell. They pierced the barrier as if it was made of paper. Star Swirl, what's happening? Hurricane fell back, the flame- And yet, she didn't eat a candy. We don't know how much time has passed between this chapter and the last chapter. She could have ate a candy between these two chapters. Filling appendages missing him by mere inches. I warned you, the victims are never stable. The unicorn's horn blazed, trying to batter back the squirming tendrils. The curse seems to- or maybe like, maybe that maybe we're all wrong. Maybe like she didn't have to eat a candy at all. Maybe she could just be under the candy mare's influence. Manifest itself differently in every pony, but I have never seen such a violent reaction as this. Most. Well, you'd assume a bite would do the same thing. That's what I'm saying. Like she definitely got bit. She got her ear bitten off. So I yeah. It's like either you get bit or you eat a candy. It's like no matter if you come in contact with the candy mare, you're fucked in in ten ways from Sunday. Most of them don't even speak beyond a few mumbles and a little mad giggling. They they don't sing. For all the powerful mage. 
prodigious efforts, the tendrils were bursting out from the protective shell in more and more places. Pansy was now little more than a swollen mass, inflating from the inside as more and more candy tendrils burst from her flesh. Whatever was inside her threatened to pop her bulging body like a ripe boil. She grew larger, tentacles bursting from every existent orifice and ripping out of new, wet, and sticky wounds. Do something! I'm... I'm trying! <laughs> a flash of violet light filled the room. I got back as quickly as I could. I found Celeste in her library, but it took longer to find Luna down in the organ room. Clover's eyes widened as she gazed upon the thing that had once been her friend. By Celestia Beard, what is going on? I don't have a beard. I swear, you must have one random spell and every pony remembers it forever. I told you, dear sister, no good would come from spending so much time with the books from Star Swirl's private library. This is no time for playful banter. Star Swirl just barely held back the wall of wriggling appendages with a shimmering wall of magic fire. Celestia's face registered horror before she carefully schooled it back into what she clearly thought was a more appropriate expression for the leader of a nation. Unfortunately, she seemed to think that was a knowing smile. It's like something brought out of a nightmare. Can you speak to it, Luna? Luna's horn sparkled. No, it's not of the natural waking or sleeping world. I'm afraid we're going to have to do this your way. Oh, don't be we're so We're going to have to blast sister. it to Kingdom it's Come. not every day we get to save Equestria. Celestia spoke joyously. Okay, so obviously Agent O'Fluffy is one of the sisters. As her horn flared with brilliant sunlight, her wings spread wide. Luna's own horn erupted in a more shadowy glow. Back to the darkness with you, vile cur! <laughs> The sisters' twined beams of magic smashed through Starswell's spell and enveloped Pansy. Her corpse squirmed like a nest of angry maggots as the brilliant sunlight burned the corruptive candy and the shadows enveloped those pieces that tried to wriggle away. Did that work? Did they defeat her that Mere easily? Moments, all that was left of poor Pansy was a small collection of bones amid a few gobbets of quivering flesh. Ew. <laughs> they defeat the candy mare that easily. Nah, that can't be true. We have one more chapter. What was that thing? Celestia probed the bits of charred feather with one delicate wing. That was not a thing. That was Private Pansy. That was Amanda my Alfie wife! Drew himself up. That was our friend. Oh. And my oh. wife! <laughs> oh, said Luna with dawning realization. This is bad, yes? Starswell, <laughs> his expression unreadable, pulled his... <laughs> it's like they just murdered a soldier in cold blood. They have no idea of the candy mare. This motherfucker pulls out a book and starts reading, like... <laughs> ...down over his face. All Clover seemed able to do was cry. Commander Hurricane, for his part, reached out a hoof to stroke the side of Pansy's broken skull. Star Swirl turned to the private saddlebag, which had been ignored this entire time, and he opened the journal he found inside. He started oh. to read... Celestia and Luna looked at each other, backed slowly towards the door, and then slipped quickly out of the room. Well, I think that could have gone better. Was that thing really private pansy, do you think? Said Celestia, as they walked quickly out of the barracks. I mean, it used to be private pansy. Wolf, I want to thank you for giving me my second hated story 
And for letting me find a character I actively despise. Who, the candy bear? Or, or, or Star Swirl? <laughs> yeah, candy bear or Star Swirl? <laughs> I mean, Star Swirl wasn't that beloved in the show either. Like, I don't think now is the time to ask. We can get the whole story from Star Swirl later. Right now, we've got other problems. Star Swirl, I figured. Without consciously realizing it, the pair took to the sky in perfect synchronization. The murdering candy demon pony is fine, but the real villain here is Star Swirl. Like, <laughs> if, if you want to take away anything from watching this. You mean? Surely those will need to be postponed in light of one of the founders having passed. I don't think that would be a good idea. If we cancel the event, every pony is going to want to know why. Do you really want to tell them we blew up one of the founders of Equestria and burned to a sender the bits that were left? Regardless of the circumstances, I doubt that's something any peasant wants to hear about their new monarch, let alone the other founders who are her friends. Oh, my third sister! Are you proposing that we practice some sort of deception? Celestia asked doubtfully, her brow knit with concern. Damn, your wings not. are huge. I just think it might be a good idea for us to focus every pony's attention on the celebration of Equestria's founding. Meanwhile, we, their protectors, can deal with whatever it is that caused the private's demise, privately, so to speak. Luna, that was a poor pun, sister. <laughs> this is now really ones. the time for but jokes. But it is meant to be a merry festival, I suppose. Perhaps it will help lighten the heavy hearts of our friends. It is a good idea, Luna. Of course. At least, I hope it's a good idea. The two sisters shared a worried glance. The wind from the north seemed to be blowing a little colder. Though it was the time of year for ice and snow, the pair could not help but feel an extra bite to the breeze. And perhaps... With their superior senses, they could feel the dark presence that was slipping into their midst. A cold, dark feeling that Luna and Celestia both doubted any celebration could ever hope to entirely dispel. Yeah. To be concluded, my dude. To be fair, it's actually a good story. I think the story is good, but Star Swirl is an idiot, just like he's always an idiot. And I, I'm going to be mad if the Candy Mare is that easily defeated. <laughs> to tell you the God honest truth. The Candy Mare just possesses some some character wait to be fair they didn't see the candy mare wasn't the description like oh she she bloated and then they shot her like they never saw the candy mare her body was just growing and then luna and celestia showed up and just shot her like they for all we know they just got rid of a bomb like a biological bomb so, I don't know. We have one more chapter, so we'll see. Alright, where's where's Agent O Fluffy? Where's Fluffy? Where's Fluffy? Where's Fluffy? Where's Fluffy? Show me Fluffy. Fluffy is in here somewhere. Show me Fluffy. Pansy was Haley K. Candy Mare was Rena Silverstone. Celestia was Fluffy! Let's go! Luna was Vil Vilda Voices. I've never heard of you before. I hope you're doing good, though. Wait, what is this? What is this song? Is this a piano cover of that Linkin Park song? Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, chat, bear with me for a moment. Wait, hold on. 
Light goes out in a sky of a million stars. It flickers, flickers. Who cares if another something, something, and something, something scars? It flickers, flickers. What is that? I think the name of the song is like Light Goes Out by, by Linkin Park. You're looking at, at art, Wolf. The music will be at the end. Okay, all right. <coughs> I think this is like a piano cover of that Linkin Park song. I'm... Goes out in the sky of a million stars. Something like that. Where's the music, you liar? You must be, you must be at like the end of this whole shebang. Okay, fine. All right, I gotta, where's part four? Is that sunset? All right, all right, fine. All right, let's see. Don't know what sunset is doing here, but. Morning. The following video contains scenes of graphic violence. Viewer discretion. What? I thought it would show in the end since every credit does it. Well, maybe we have to wait until the credits of the finale. Maybe, perhaps. Speaking of Linkin Park, that Diamond Tiara X Linkin Park song is a bop. I have no idea what you're talking about. Is advised. But I'll look into it, I guess. I gotta look at everything pony before I die. Lincoln Park Diamond Tiara. Uh, what the hell? Lincoln Park Diamond Tiara. Showing results for Lincoln Park Diamond Tiara. Oh God! What am I looking at? The play ended to thunderous applause. Every pony in attendance stomping their pleasure. The closing song had gone over very well, though Starswell was a little unsure about the heart carol's lyrics. Still, it tended to be the simplest songs that stood the test of time, so even if the play were to be forgotten, the song might live on, spreading the message of friendship and togetherness. Having been granted glimpses into the myriad possible futures of Equestria through his own experimentation with travel in both time and dimensions, Starswell was sure that such sentiments would be pivotal in times to come. It was tempting indeed to skip ahead in his own timeline to discover what might become of Celestia and Luna, but he feared learning too much about the mares they might become could ruin the relationship he had with them in the here and now. Celestia this motherfucker just casually time traveled is that what you're telling often me often seemed the more poised of the two but once you got to know her she had a somewhat silly and studious side that bordered on what younger ponies would consider geeky okay it was at the bottom of the description and yes it was a Lincoln Park one more light piano cover let's go I fucking nailed it boys let's go Luna the ever more distant and unapproachable was actually extremely kind to animals and enjoyed sharing a good laugh, though this could lead to some very vexing pranks. It was the Was the play about the founding of Equestria? I guess it was like on that remember that episode of MLP where like Twilight is reading a story to Starlight and it's about it, it's about the founding of Equestria? I have to assume it was something like that, yeah. But we didn't really, like, the play wasn't important. All that matters is that they went to a play, I guess. 
Yeah. These two he now sought as the great hall slowly drained of audience members. Ah, Star Swirl, a marvelous performance, wasn't it? I didn't know it would be so exciting, said Celestia enthusiastically as the old unicorn made his way through the press of admiring nobles. It was clever of you to sneak the new flag of the unified equestria in at the end. Don't listen to my sister. She was complaining about the flag's presence being inaccurate when our royal selves had not yet been introduced. Yep, that's Nina fluffy. rolled her eyes. Given the overall tenor of the play, however, I very much doubt accuracy is all that important to the overall message. If possible, it seemed that the younger sister had enjoyed the play almost more than her older sister. Her smile faded slightly as she saw the look on Star Swirl's bearded face. Pray tell. Is something wrong, dear Star Swirl? Was the play not to thy liking? Oh, no. The play was wonderful, of course. The old unicorn chuckled, doing his best to allay not only Luna's concern, but those of the nearby nobility as well. I was simply hoping to have a word with the two of you. In private, perhaps? Though the crowd was trickling out of the building, there were still many ponies on all sides. Such a request was ludicrous. Or at least, it would have been, coming from any other pony. Why, of course, Star Swirl. We always have time for your valley device. Naturally, I agree with my sister. Shall you do the honors, or shall I? By all means. Allow me. Star Swirl lit his horn, and a large cloud of smoke enveloped the trio. Dancing starlight swirled through the thick blue haze, dazzling those nearby, and leaving every pony gasping and coughing in mild dismay. I like this Celestia more and back with the garble. <laughs> well, you like pink haired Celestia. That's young Celestia. This is like Celestia, like what pre ruler of Equestria for a thousand years. Pre before she sent Luna to the moon, pre moon Luna Celestia. That was a bit showier than usual, Starswell. Felt like making a grand exit. They stood in the highest tower of Canterlot Castle. The air up here was frigid at the best of times, but right now it was downright freezing. Celestia and Luna both could not help shivering as the wind tugged at them. The few stars above that could be seen through the cloud cover twinkled merrily enough, but at this time and in this place, they seemed far more distant and colder than usual. Starswell, for his part, stood as if the elements could not so much as touch him, save for his cloak and long beard. The look in his eyes made the Alicorn sisters cringe inwards. <laughs> the look in his eyes made the Alicorn sisters cringe. <laughs> cringe and fold in on themselves. It's like, Starswell, why do you look like that, man? He was their friend, but he had also been something like a teacher to them. Clover the Clever may have been his Let me tell you, the Candy Mare would not like me. I mean, I'm a unicorn. Yeah, the Candy Mare... The Candy Mare doesn't like any race, but the Candy Mare specifically... Specifically doesn't like unicorns. Specifically. Apprentice, but she was not the only powerful little pony that Starswell had watched over and guided. More than anything, they feared that a lecture was forthcoming. No, fair Luna. It was merely the most expert spell I knew to get us away from the crowd. As you may have gathered, I have something of importance to impart upon you. Well, you have to say, the Star's old mage paused, taking a deep breath and gazing up into the frosty night. But first, tell me, what do you two think of the weather? Why, tis most glorious, <laughs> though perhaps a bit bracing upon these high towers and ramparts. I agree with Luna. It is rare for us to have ice and snow this early in the season. The Pegasi have outdone themselves. The Pegasi have done nothing at all. A flash of blue magic burst from the unicorn's horn, spreading across the sky and penetrating the clouds. An echoing terrifying scream spread across the sky before it was blended with the howling wind. Something ethereal took shape just above the tower 
like a ghostly horse outlined with ice and shimmering with snow. The apparition was there and gone in an instant, as a flaming heart took shape in the air and dispelled the chilly aura. But both the Alicorn sisters knew what the creature was on sight. They had been visited by a Windigo. Our frosty evening is no work of Pegasi. But I don't understand. I thought you had said the Windigos were keyed to the northern race. Celestia's brow knitted in worry. That so long as we stuck to the principles of unity and harmony, they would have no negative emotions to feed off of here in Equestria. I and my sister have kept to your principles, Starswill. We have guided this fledging nation through many trials already. We have not strayed from its founding edicts of love and tolerance for all pony kind. Luna was flustered in her attempts to be heard over the rising wind. I know. There was a grim cast to Starswell's face. However, the Pegasi have been disturbed. Ever since we lost Private Pansy, it seems Commander Hurricane has abandoned our plans to instead pursue those of his own. In time, he will begin to rebel openly against you. We cannot oh, no. among the tribes. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! Stage in Equestria's. Those goddamn unicorns killed my friend, and now I'm going to get my revenge. History. Must we risk this realm being blanketed by the same frozen death as the old lands? The Windigos are too numerous for us to keep at bay without preserving harmony and working together to overcome them. I'm afraid you may have to intercede in this matter. Commander Hurricane. God damn those cis white men. All right, never mind. This nonsense. Pansy's tragic passing. But I thought he was merely taking time to grieve. I did not know he had so abandoned his duties. Nor did I. Starswell gave a deep frown. I'm afraid I've been overly absorbed in finding a cure for the candy curse. I worry there may be other spell work at play here. Old spells unknown to unicorn or even alicorn magic. As much information as the journal Pansy recovered was able to relate to us, and as much information as we were able to glean from the Pegasi that cared for her before she... before she turned. I'm afraid we're still in the dark as to say what can be done to stop this menace. The unicorn's eyes drifted over the city below. I fear that it may be my lack of progress that has led Commander Hurricane to consider more mundane and militaristic solutions. Is this not as it should be? If there is no magical solution, and there is no apparent negotiating with this monster, this candy mare, then surely it is up to the military might of Equestria to put down this threat. The Pegasi, after all, traditionally defend the other pony tribes in times of peril. Yes, Luna, but that is our job now. We are the guardians of Equestria. I believe this is why you brought us here now, Starswell. Celestia bowed her head low. Though we spent so much time on it, and though it was truly delightful, our play alone cannot be expected to hold together our alliance. No, we are the guardians of Equestria as its rulers, and it is time we dealt with matters to allay the fears of our people and to lay to rest the problem of this shadowy threat that looms over us all. For Commander Hurricane's sake, most of all, it should be we who take on this burden. Well spoken, Celestia. A small smile brightened Starswell's doer expression. I confess, though I've made little progress in neutralizing the cure itself, I have considered other methods that might be able to help us thwart this monster. Would they perhaps involve the Tree of Harmony? I've been doing more research on the symbols of the tree since Lua and I received our cutie marks. That they match two prominent marks on the Tree of Harmony can be no coincidence. I suspect that there are others out there who will also find that they represent certain elements of harmony and that with their aid, we might come to better understand the awesome power offered by that most ancient of artifacts. In time, Celestia, I believe that will be true in time. But in the here and now, yeah, I don't think Twilight was born here. Consider. 
In my studies with travels through time and dimensions, I have stumbled across a realm where magic does not seem to naturally exist. At first, I dismissed the realm. I was introducing such a wild force as my own magic into the plane that is not adapted to its existence could have dire consequences. <laughs> but I have come to second thoughts about this, however. And I think that it may prove a boon to us in the times to come. With its complete lack of magic, it's possible that it could have a dampening effect on any curse or magical creature that was banished there. This would have the double effect of removing the creature from Equestria as well as weakening it to the point it would pose no threat to even the other world. Ingenious. Yet you had not mentioned this before. I fear an unspoken but is in our near future. Starswell's expression turned sour again. Uh, it is true, Princess. I am afraid the portal to the realm I speak of is only open once every 30 moons. The last cycle ended not that long ago, so I'm afraid this would not be by any means a speedy solution. But rather one we could plan for and work towards over the coming months, which we can use to help combat this disgusting infection. That is... All right, enough talking. Where's the candy mare? This is a bunch of setup right now. This is just a bunch of information dump that I'm going to have to remember later on in this story. It's unacceptable. Luna interrupted with a suddenness that startled Starswell, causing the erudite unicorn to sputter to a stop in mid-sentence. If this matter is as dire as thou portends, then we should act swiftly and stop this candied abomination. If I understand what you've been saying, she is less a living pony and more a living nightmare. Since taking stewardship of the moon and the night of Equestria, I have become acquainted with new powers that my vocation provides. As you said to us before, Starswell, the spell to raise the moon rejuvenates and recharges my alicorn magic. But it has done so much more. I can now cast spells of transmogrification with ease, change my own shape and that of others like an ever-shifting shadow. Her eyes glowed as she spoke. The night seeming to grow darker around them, lightning dancing through the snow clouds. Basically make it someone else's problem. His plan is to literally throw a candy mare to another world, which means cause problems to innocent people. I mean, what exactly does he mean by throw it to another world? Is that a world made of lava? Because if that's the case, the candy mare will die. And it's like, what does he mean by another world? <laughs> I keep, I keep stalling on this question. Where is he? Where is he gonna send her exactly? I mean, they could, they could just blast her off the face of the earth. They're alicorns. They could probably like stand up to her. Probably, maybe, perhaps. But it's like, I don't know. The Equestria Girl world? Ah, oh, come on, man. That's not a good idea. He's talking about the human world. What the fu- <laughs> What? I guess that explains why Sunset is in the thumbnail, I suppose. But yeah, that's a, that's a terrible idea. Oh, Star Swirl, you are so wise, but at the same time, so stupid. No, you know what? You're not even wise. You're just dumb. You're just so like you're a wizard with bells on his hat. You're an and old yes, fool. I believe I have learned something of how to deal with nightmares. I believe I know a faster way to handle this being that threatens Equestria. Uh, that's good, yeah. isn't it? Asked Starswell uncertainly, not entirely sure it was. This was a side of Luna he had never seen before. Quite good, I should think, but that is only the first step. The candy mare has already become a boogie mare, striking fear into the ponies of Equestria by word of mouth as much as by deed. I think that poor pansy was sacrificed to sow such fear amongst us. It is this unease that is likely responsible for our Wendigo's appearance here tonight. I think it would be wise to suppress the tales of the candy mare. Forbidding the spread of such tales may have the opposite effect of what you desire, princess, said Starswell matter-of-factly. Then what do you suggest, Starswell? Luna's gaze unsettled the old unicorn slightly. Perhaps we replace the tales with a new story. It may 
Maybe about <coughs> you brave princesses and how you defeat the monster and how much you love and cherish your people to face such a nightmare. Once the deed is accomplished, of course. He added as an afterthought. Ha! I like this plan. Tis one of which I approve very much. Luna hmm. tossed her head, once again her more cheerful self. And as the say, then. Celestia's serious demeanor faded away as well. No, enough of this skullduggery. I propose we get out of this cold and get ourselves some mugs of hot cocoa. It is still heartwarming eve, an official holiday if I recall the declaration, and we will still have many guests to attend to in the palace below. There shall be much merriment, and I am given to believe there may be a gift exchange as well. A novel idea, but one I hope becomes a tradition. That sounds delightful, but I fear it may be... Oh, good old time for little ponies to be heading to bed. Starswell's age showed for the first time since they had arrived on the tower. Neither Luna nor Celestia bored the exaggerated frail old pony act for a moment. With a crafty smile, the powerful sorcerer vanished in another puff of blue smoke, leaving the sisters alone atop the Alicorn Citadel. I swear, these pony folk are always sleeping through my beautiful nights. It strikes me as downright ungrateful. <laughs> Season have to one, do Luna. About that as well in the future. <laughs> well, a problem to be dealt with another time, dear sister. Celestia gathered her smaller sibling under her sheltering wing. For now, let us merely say to our guests and wish them all a happy heart swarming and to all a good night. You see, Reggie, you're going to cut him some slack. And I'm sitting here thinking about that sentence like, okay, if I was an old pony geezer, and I knew that there was like this terrible, terrible threat looming somewhere in the woods. Would I actually keep it to myself in order to prevent a mass panic? Like mass panic and pandemonium. And honestly, I don't have the answer for you right now like i think that's one of those questions that you really have to sit down and think about because it's like everybody is like of course i'll tell them it's like yeah you'll you'll tell them but like actually put yourself in the situation actually like be the person that's like all right i'll tell everybody and then have everybody just freak the fuck out because that's that's a whole nother problem altogether and in a lot of situations, I feel like that would get more ponies hurt than anything. Because the candy mare is still out there, right? So it's like, I don't know. I, I got to get to the end of this, man. Then I'll tell you what I think. I, I just don't know right now. dusty mirror in a dimly lit room. God damn Forgotten it, it is a question, girls. a layer girls. of cobwebs sat silently. Almost expectantly. Unlike the other broken down bits of furniture and scattered books, this item did not have the air of an abandoned object. Rather, the looking glass almost seemed to be waiting. Like a patient if annoyed companion whose compatriot has been late one too many times. A disturbance in the air caused the webs to shift, the dust to fall in a tiny waterfall-like cascade. The ancient, mummified corpses of long-dead flies and the spiders who caught them danced and twirled in a parody of their former lives. <laughs> Thank Without you for warning, that description, Scrubber. A bright Scrubber. flash of light illuminated the storage room, sending tattered dust covers dancing like so many ghosts. The room was suddenly occupied. Huh. It worked. The cloaked figure. Hey! <laughs> the beginning of Equestria Girls, exactly. This was all familiar. Good. The element of surprise was on her side, but she did not have a moment to lose. The pony moved, swift as a fleeting shadow across the dusty floor. 
With only a moment's hesitation, she pushed open. So this is just gonna be this is just gonna be Sunset stealing the crown again, right? Open the door to the storage room and step How far back is is this? Is Twilight here? Doubt into the palace halls. All was dark and quiet. No, if Twilight was here, then Star Swirl wouldn't be here. This is earlier. Quiet. It was the middle is it? of the night. I have here, no idea. Just as it had been in the world that the cloaked figure had come from. There did not seem to be any guards about, which was all the better for But Sunset Sunset was a pupil of Celestia for a time. So that's something else I gotta remember. Her plans. Still, she moved quickly but cautiously through the hallway. The spell that silenced her hoofsteps would only work for so long, but if she was fast, she could snatch the element of magic before Celestia would be any the wiser. She could sense the power of the elements nearby, but they were faint. All she would need was a second. That stupid Twilight Sparkle, who had replaced her in Celestia's heart, was hopefully still sleeping. And probably snoring her stupid fat head off, too. Who is playing Sunset right now? Everything was. There was not even a hint of a breeze. A breath of air. Indeed, the cloaked figure could not help but think that the edifice was not unlike a neglected tomb, a sepulchre long abandoned. Just how long had she really been gone? Was it possible that what had seemed like a few years to her had been ages on this side of the portal? Had she somehow miscalculated? Where is every pony? With a growing sense of unease, she set hoof into the main hall, and her breath caught in her throat. <gasps> the palace was a wreck. The few remaining tapestries, torn to shreds, hung limply from the walls and archways. A shimmering carpet of jagged, multicolored shards was all that remained of the stained glass windows, which Celestia had once cherished so dearly. Where are Beyond you? Beyond those glassless apertures lay When are darkness. you? <laughs> as if something had blotted out every star in the sky. The cloaked mare was not sure if she was relieved or terrified when she discovered that the windows were merely blocked by piles of rubble. Apparently, the very masonry of the palace that had stood for time immemorial lay thick enough on the ground to bury what remained of the great hall. The buildings that had survived for over a thousand years since Equestria's founding had been reduced to mere rubble. Is this a leap what into the future? What happened here? What had have ha what has happened? happened? Some terrible cataclysm? Or had the old citadel simply been left to the ravages of the ages and now lay in the relentless jaws of entropy? Only one way to find out. Deciding what the fuck that the is need going on? <laughs> information now trumped her need for stealth. She risked a translocation spell. She only hoped that the balcony was still there. In a flash of green, not unlike the last rays of the setting sun, the hooded figure found her hooves on solid, if sticky, ground. The balcony still existed, though its shape was irregular and bizarre in the chilly moonlight. She had been right in one regard. It was indeed night. If the position of the stars were any indication, it was the right time of year as well. Indeed, even the correct era. But everything else was terribly, terribly wrong. Beneath the So this is during the future. So some oh fuck the candy mare happened, didn't alright, okay, alright. Full moon. She could just glimpse the landscape through a thick pool of mist and fog. Equestria spread out below in a twisted parody of its former majesty. Okay. The land was luminescent in the dark, Something sparkling bad beneath happened. a sugar-frosted coating that seemed to dust everything. The distant forests, supported by thick candy cane tree trunks, lifted glowing candied leaves to the stars. What should have been grassy fields stretched far into the distance in bright pink bubblegum shades. A green, gloppy sludge that passed for a river bubbled and fizzed along its banks. The very air was heavy and cloying, the scent of so many sweets threatening to suffocate the mare. 
And the city, once proud and prosperous, Cantalot now lay in ruin. Mm. What few parts of it still stood were now bizarre, gingerbread versions of their former glory. Even the balcony upon which she stood, the refinements of the palace itself, all had been transformed into a confectioner's mockery of its once sublime beauty. A chill seemed to penetrate the cloaked pony's body from all sides, though it had nothing to do with the misty atmosphere, even if it was as cold as a windigo's heart. No, there was a deep, dark, ancient magic at work here, the kind that made every hair in her mane and tail stand on end. So Lowering is... her hood, even Sunset Shimmer could not help but mutter to herself. Thy celestial spirit. So er, 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 every is pony is just dead. <laughs> every pony the is just gone. And yellow mane, vibrant in the silvery light, Celestia's former apprentice felt all her dark ambitions evaporate as she looked down upon the wreckage of the once mighty pony civilization. What good had all her planning been? What use now did she have for a mind-controlled army? Did she really want to conquer this dump? <laughs> That's a good point. What happened here? Had she waited too long? She had originally planned to invade before Halloween, but had stayed her plans to better cultivate her army. How long had Equestria been like this? She had not been home for more than information gathering visits since she left in anger years ago. On her last trip here, after the summer sun celebration, when Luna returned, everything had seemed fine. Could she have prevented this? What of Celestia's vaunted student, Twilight Sparkle? Where was she while all this wreck and ruin was happening? That's a good question. Cadence, the pony chosen to be an alicorn ahead of the much more deserving sunset. What of Luna herself? Surely the ruler of the night could have... <gasps> a distant mountain rumbled suddenly on the horizon, interrupting her thoughts. Was it some kind of volcano? Was that what had blanketed everything in this unnatural candy shell? What truly bizarre feat of magic could spawn such a thing? Had Discord somehow been freed from his stone prison? No. Um, this mountain was something Yes, else. but <laughs> that's Luna not what we're watched, talking about. Lights flickered all across the mountain as tiny blue flames sparked to life all along the craggy surface. The mountain shook again, this time causing the already crumbling city to pitch and heave violently, as though it were a ship caught on a stormy sea. The earthquake intensifying, it was all Sunset Shimmer could do to hold on to the balcony's railing as the mountain rose and seemed to blot out the night sky. The quakes came in a steady rhythm now, accompanied by a series of thunderous booms. Nearby buildings shattered into cookie-crumb pieces, while a great exhalation of frigid air seemed to sweep away the fog. It was then that Sunset could see what the mist had been hiding. Bones. A thick carpet of them were strewn all across the city. Okay, the well, yeah, all right, naked all right. Bones and smiling skulls of long dead ponies. Everyone, everyone just dead. Everyone's gone. The moon. As the moving mountain loomed over her, sunset could see. What the fuck am I looking at? What is that? Fleshy heads set in the side of the candy crag, though there were far too many to count. Some. Oh my god, familiar. she. Breathed in azure. The candy mare has reached ultimate power. This is her final form. The flames, the skull's jaws hung open in inaudible screams. <laughs> it was none of this that held the unicorn's attention, however. No, it was the face. That horrible, hideous face that hovered just above the balcony, blotting out the sky. Beneath a mane of crimson tendrils, 
which cascaded like a waterfall down one side of the gargantuan, misshapen head. Eyes that seemed to be the size of the moon glowed with malice and madness, focusing squarely on Sunset Shimmer. This was no <sighs> bizarre volcano or mountain, but something far worse. <laughs> Why that does horrible sunset moment look of like realization that the Colossus was in fact looking right back at her. The thing smiled. Teeth as large as the palace's shattered spires pried slowly apart, and a long, thick tongue scraped across them, leaving a trail of translucent drool. Sunset Shimmer could just see a reflection of herself in one candy corn colored tooth. What? No. Get away from me. Get away. <laughs> ah! She just ate her? She just chomped her? After a quick, bloody crunch, the candy mare's laughter was the only sound that filled the dead world that should have rung at this time of year with heartwarming carols and the laughter of uncorrupted children. Happy hearts warming. Is that it? Is that all? Is that it? Am I free? Oh my god. <laughs> So, wait a minute. I will get to the chat in a moment, but I just want to, I just want to reiterate that like, um, the way this story ends is that basically Star Squirrel was like, we need to do something about the candy mare. And then it cuts years into the future. Sunset comes back trying to steal the crown. But the Candy Mare has gotten so fucking powerful that she has become like this, this giant goddamn mountain in the distance that just wiped out all other pony kind. And so she just casually picks up Sunset and crunches down on her. That's all. That's it. This story was kind of, well, it's a grimdark, right? So it's going to be dour. And it's going to be depressing. But let me get to the chat real quick. Karma, this might not be your favorite story, but you have to keep in mind that this is fan fiction. Whatever the author writes, it, it goes. That's how fan fiction works. Because I see you in the chat being like, this doesn't work here. And it's like, mm, bro, it's fan fiction. The whole point of fan fiction is that you write something on... In like a in in a word document, and then it flies because it's fan fiction. Fan fiction can be whatever you want it to be. Obviously, I think I think the the notion of candy magic is bullshit. But that it doesn't matter what I think about candy magic because it's not my fan fiction. I suck at writing. But if the author is like, oh, this is like some fucking candy magic bullshit, I'd be like, all right, I guess this is some candy magic bullshit. I don't like that explanation, but it's it's fan fiction, dude. Not everyone is dead. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, would you recommend me reacting to something sweet to bite by Emo Gak? If so, I'm gonna have to find a vector of Emo Gak. a minute to realize what I was looking at. Oh my god, that's just like the bottom half of Sunset's body sticking out of the fucking head of the candy mare. Alright, fine, fine. Yes, it explains a lot. Alright, because I'm not confused by the story. Like when you when you present to me a fan fiction that is centered around the show My Little Pony, that is centered around 
a magical land where horse where ponies are in charge and they talk and magic is real it's like i don't think when it comes to like my suspension of disbelief where it's like it's already pretty low at that point right it's like right there see even many fanfics i read they have their magic grounded and i'm just like bro it's magic <laughs> Like, magic already on the surface level is pretty fictional. Just the concept of magic. To the point where I'm like, magic could be whatever the fuck you want it to be. This song is great, by the way. What song is this? But, I will say this, I do understand your plight. Because there is some things with, like, understanding about how the Candy Mare came to be. Maybe it's, like, maybe the point of the Candy Mare is, like, maybe it's supposed to be vague up until I react to the, to the, to the, to the sequel of this. And then maybe I'll explain it more how the Candy Mare came to be. Because reading, from this fanfic alone, wait, let me change the thing. Cause like, I'll pl I'll play the song, but I'm gonna switch to this. Maybe, yeah, maybe the sequel will explain more how the Candy Mare came to be. Because all this fic told us is that like, okay, they got kidnapped by this unicorn. The unicorn was a bad unicorn, bad unicorn, and. The unicorn made her eat her father, and then she began to eat and eat and eat until she became the candy mare, which on the on the surface doesn't really make any sense. Like you you don't just become a cannibal pony and then turn into this thing, right? So there has to be some kind of magic somewhere that turns you into this. Thank you to everyone who has made this production possible. The voice cast, the artists, the fans who turned in each video. And most of all, Knackerman for writing such a glorious, creepy holiday story. You have to remember, this came out after that story. Alright, cool. Merry Christmas, everypony. Get your Christmas out of here! It's October, it's spooky month. I do love this picture of just the candy mare standing with like half of Sunset's body in its mouth. I love that shit so much. Oh boy. Alright. Alright, well that's it for me, guys. I gotta go to work tomorrow. Uh, Carol of the Bells featuring Madame McCarve. That's the music. Okay, okay. I gotta look into that later. Thank you for everybody joining. Uh, don't forget to like that video. Uh, to like that stream, I should say. My cat keeps meowing, but I don't know where she is. She's behind me. This is the part of the stream where I show my bullshit. Hit that join button and become a mad lad. It's a dollar a month. That's all I got. Buy my sticker. Um, watch my videos. Hit that subscriber button. Or hit that sub button. Turn, ring the bell, whatever the fuck the YouTubers say. And I will see you guys later. Bye-bye.